26, 2015. We are coming to you live from the studios of the Hagman and Hagman Report here in northwest Pennsylvania. I'm Doug Hagman at the helm with fellow investigator, researcher, and most importantly, my son, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report, America's premier father-son investigative reporting team. Folks, our job, well... We're tasked with bringing you the news that propels the headlines, the news that's shaped and twisted and contorted and hidden amid a funhouse of smoke and mirrors in the carnival we call the corporate media. We do the headline and news triage so you don't have to. And we want to just welcome all the new listeners. God bless you. Thank you. And also welcome all the veteran listeners. Of course, for the new listeners, we broadcast live Monday through Friday, 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Our home base on the Internet is Hagman and Hagman.com. Check it out there tonight for the program promo, and uh, it's right there. Also, uh, at our home base at Hagman and Hagman.com, you can access us live as well as all of our past shows. Just click on the RSS feed, social networking sites, and most importantly, our original investigative reports tonight. We've got a very special show planned for you tonight, um, beginning at the bottom of the hour. Nathan Leal, Watchman's Cry, will be joining us. But first, in the wake of a 5-4 Supreme Court decision, we are pleased to have on with us Mr. Greg Jackson. Two G's on Greg, G-R-E-G-G, Jackson.com, author and radio show host. Before we bring him on, Joe, how you doing? Doing great. It's been a long day. I have talked to several people, uh, read several emails and communications, and uh, there's a lot of uh, emotions out there running high. But with that, uh, we have Greg Jackson on the line. Greg, welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Thank you for having me, guys. God bless you. It's always a distinct honor to be on your show and with your with the Hagman and Hagman family. So let's all take a deep breath. Ready? <laughs> Relax, because as you said, it, it has been a, it, it's been one of those days. But it's I think we can all weeks. agree that I think we can all save one of those weeks. Yeah, a lot coming at us. But I don't think if we're going to take an honest assessment and inventory, Joe and Doug, that any of this should be surprising to anybody who's even remotely awake to see <laughs> yeah, what you know the what, signs Greg, of the times are. You're yeah. exactly right, and, and you know. Um, I do want you to, to, to share with the, with the folks what you said to me off air before showtime. But first, Greg, let, let me just interject something here. Uh, so proud, folks. Tonight's broadcast sponsored by Nature Box. Nature Box ships great tasting, guilt free snacks. Snacks made with integrity, palate pleasers, if you will. They ship it right to your door. They've got over 100 flavors to choose from. Man, you pick them. Uh, mini Belgian waffles, my goodness. Asiago and cheddar cheese crisps, pistachio power clusters. I can name so many, but you'll never get tired. You'll never get bored of snacking again. Folks, try NatureBox for free by going to naturebox.com slash CFP radio. That's naturebox.com slash CFP radio. Greg, I want to interject that because um, they're great sponsors of ours, but uh, uh, man, uh, it, it, I just had to reach for comfort my comfort snacks as we're talking about this, you know, I, I, what you said before the, before the show, man. Oh, but go yeah. ahead, sir. I, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Go no, sorry. no, um, I, no, no need. I know that, uh, you know, you guys, um, got to pay the bills. I love all of your sponsors, by the way. And, um, I need to order me some snack box or snack. And what is it called? Nature box. Oh yeah. Nature box. Oh because man! Because you, every time you you describe it, Doug, I, my mouth just waters. I'm like, okay, I got. I mean, the cheddar, cheddar popcorn, and all the, all the different things. So I'm I'm sold. I I have to order some of this stuff. <laughs> but having having said that, do you mind if I, I want to make a couple of of points? And, and I think that all of your listeners, unless they've been, you know, not on any of you know the internet or watching the news today. Is, you know, needs to know that the Supreme Court did rule 5-4, as many anticipated and expected, that there is a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, which, of course, is laughable. It's absurd, but not surprising. And I think that a couple of things that I'd like to say is, one is that you've had some recent guests on your show, including Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, and you guys went in obedience to God to Washington, D.C., and prayed for those justices. You also had Ryan Sorba, who is a good friend of mine, uh, 
just a brave man of God who has made these videos that many of your uh, you know, members of the Hagman Hagman family have seen because I know they're on Hagman and Hagman.com. And if you haven't seen them, you really need to see them because it will definitely shape and broaden your understanding of homosexuality in general. And so I wanted to say before I get into why every governor in the United States has a constitutional oath-bound duty to reject this totally toothless, unconstitutional, absurd ruling from the Supreme Court and not enforce it. But before we get into that, I did want to say that for any of you in the audience who might think that, wow, you know, God didn't answer the prayers of those who obediently went to Washington, D.C. and prayed around the country, um, you know, all of Ryan Sorba's great investigative journalistic work behind the scenes with the undercover videos, none of that stuff has really mattered. And I would like to submit, Joe and Doug, that that couldn't be further from the truth. Because whenever we, in obedience, uh, you know, submit and humble ourselves with a contrite heart and a broken spirit and obey God, we always win. We always achieve the victory. And, by the way, just because the Supreme Court issued an opinion on an individual case before it doesn't mean that the, that the fight is over. It doesn't mean that marriage is totally destroyed, although I think, I think uh, it definitely uh, was significantly wounded, if, if you will, uh, today. And, and I think the bottom line is this, is that the first thing that we as the Hagman and Hagman family need to do is take a deep breath and pray, because God is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. He ordained, he established, he instituted marriage. It's still between a man and a woman. You cannot redefine what God himself has already declared, instituted, ordained, and defined. I don't care how many judges, voters, legislators vote to, to redefine what God himself has defined. It doesn't matter. Uh, in, 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 in the grand scheme of things, Joe and Doug. If you will, do you mind if I just read my short post that I posted tonight? Because I think it really, it, it, it's a good uh, uh, a response to the Supreme Court decision. I posted it on Facebook. And do you mind if I just read it? To, it won't take long. Not at all. No, please. Okay. So this is, this is again, my, and I, I sent it out to the media, it's for publication. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think that I understand judicial supremacy. I think I, I understand this issue pretty well. Um, you know, I've, I, I've written extensively on it. I, you know, my my previous uh, a book, dealt, uh, We Won't Get Fooled Again, dealt specifically with the issue of judicial supremacy uh, or ceding authority to the judiciary that the judiciary doesn't possess, which is lawmaking authority. And it's one of the reasons that our culture and society has, has veered so Radically, here's my, my statement. The Supreme Court opinion issued today that there is a supposed constitutional right for so-called, quote, same-sex marriage, unquote, is blatantly immoral, illegal, and unconstitutional and must be rejected and ignored by every civil magistrate at every level and branch of government. More significantly, it is a violation of God's immutable word, God has exclusively established, ordained, and defined marriage as the exclusive union of one man and one woman, period. Woe to the judges who voted to redefine what God himself has explicitly defined. And woe to any state governor who claims that the, quote, court has ruled, unquote, and, quote, gay marriage is the new law of the land, unquote, and authorizes alterations to and issuance of marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and in parentheses I have, as Mitt Romney unilaterally, illegally, and unconstitutionally did as governor of Massachusetts. <clears throat> when and if they do, meaning the governors, they will be illegally authorizing the issuance of legally null and void marriage licenses, violating their oaths, and undermining the oldest form of government ever given to man from God, i.e. marriage, which is the seminal foundation of all healthy and virtuous societies, wondering if there is even one governor who will abide by his sworn constitutional oath and tell the Supreme Court where they can put their toothless, illegal, immoral, and totally unconstitutional opinions, since any law 
or court opinion contrary to God's law is no law at all, as Lincoln did when he rightly rejected and ignored the immoral and totally unconstitutional Dred Scott opinion that blacks were only three-fifths of human beings. And that's, that was my post. And I also posted subsequent posts, which I think you guys will enjoy. If Supreme Court opinions on individual cases before actually became the law of the land, superseding laws, statutes, constitutions, and God's immutable word, the very moment they were issued, then blacks would be considered three-fifths of a person, according to the Dred Scott opinion, which to this day, Joe and Doug, has yet to be overturned by the Supreme Court. In other words, Supreme Court opinions aren't law, and they're not the law of the land the minute they're issued. So I'm going to go on record and say that any governor of any that, and by the way, jurisdictional authority over issuance of marriage licenses is part of the executive branch, and if any governor pulls the Mitt Romney and says, the judges are making me do it, the gay marriage is the new law of the land, and if they illegally authorize any alterations to marriage licenses from husband and wife to partner A and partner B, like Mitt Romney did illegally, unconstitutionally and, and, and immorally, he belongs in jail. By the way, Arnold Schwarzenegger did the same thing in California, Terry Branstad. These are all Republican governors, by the way. And by the way, it was Republican majority who gave us Roe versus Wade, who has given us Obergefell, who has given us Obamacare. So I don't want to hear from any Republicans that we need to elect more Republicans to elect more <laughs> law and order. I mean, this is that's a definition of insanity. Hmm. But the the the, the 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 other quote that I wanted to read to your audience is a very brief quote from Thomas Jefferson. I've read it before on your, on your program, but it's so pertinent to what we're dealing with today with the Supreme Court opinion that they issued. And Jefferson said, to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions is a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism oligarchy. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided, with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. Thomas Jefferson was talking about what happened today on June 26, 2015, I believe, when we, when we cede authority to the weakest branch of government, which is the judiciary. And if you... If any of your readers want to, are saying, what do you mean? I thought they were co-equal branches. No. The judiciary was designed intentionally by the founding fathers, and you can read Federalist 78 that Alexander Hamilton wrote. For more on this, it's very clear that the judiciary has neither the power of the sword nor the power of the purse, uh, and that they have no lawmaking authority. It says the judiciary from the nature of its functions, will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution, Hamilton said. The judiciary has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or of the wealth of a society, and can take, listen to this, Joe and Doug, no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will. So if, if marriage licenses begin to be issued to same-sex couples, it's the governors who are authorizing it. Don't forget it. The Supreme Court would have no power unless the other two branches licked their boots and submitted to them and treated their toothless, immoral, and unconstitutional opinions as if they were presto, the law of the land, de facto law. That's exactly what has happened with Roe versus Wade. It's exactly what happened with every single unconstitutional court opinion whether it's on Obamacare, whether it's on Lawrence v. Texas, which were sodomy laws, or Obergefell, which is, which is today, or the Windsor decision. So the bottom line is, it, 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 if people are asking what can they do, number one, pray, or take a deep breath first, then pray. I need to take a deep breath. I'm getting a little fired up. <laughs> take a deep breath, pray, right? 
and understand yeah. that, that God is sovereign. He's called us just to be obedient, to speak the truth. And then as an action step, after those things, I would pray that maybe Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer and I will get together and we can do a, have a subsequent effort to have Christians and conservatives in all 50 states go to their state houses and say exactly what I said today in no uncertain terms, which is, you governors illegally authorize any alterations to any marriage licenses and falsely claim, as Mitt Romney did, that the court made you do it or that this opinion is the new law of the land, you will be acting illegally, immorally, unconstitutionally, and should be removed from office. And any of those licenses that are that are issued, by the way, are legally null and void. And, Greg, um, since yes. the ruling has come down, we have Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana and Governor Abbott of Texas, uh, Greg mm-hmm. Abbott, um, both saying they will not uh, – this is what Greg Abbott said today – the Supreme Court has abandoned its role as an impartial judicial arbitrator and has become an unelected nine-member legislator. Uh, five justices on the Supreme Court have imposed on the entire country their personal view on an issue that constitute that the Constitution and the Court's previous decisions reserve to the people of the states. It goes on to say that the uh, Texas Constitution guarantees the uh, no human authority ought in any case whatsoever to control or interfere with the rights of conscious in the matters of religion. And it goes on to say that, as he has done in the past, he will stand up uh, for the liberties of religious people in Texas and all of Texans, and he will uh, issue a directive banning the practice of same-sex marriage in Texas. And Bobby Jindal is following suit, saying he will not marry or offer any uh, recognized same-sex marriages in Louisiana. Well, praise God. You know, I've been writing on this, and I know that, um, and I think I've blind copied you guys or copied you guys on a number of these communications. I know I'm not the only one preparing for this day, encouraging our civil magistrates at every branch and level of government, but especially governors, since they are the chief executive officers of the state, the chief law enforcement officers, to do exactly, so praise God, hallelujah, uh, hopefully other governors will follow suit. I do want to add one thing, not to muddy the waters, but even if it's, and by the way, 47 states have voted, guys, and they're, they're the, the quote-unquote straight states, right, where uh, they've prohibited same-sex unions, and they've uh, defined in, this, in their marriage statutes that marriage is the exclusive union of one man and one woman. But I would also take it one step further and say that even if a state did vote, and they voted legislatively or uh, the people voted in a citizen initiative or ballot initiative or uh, amended the Constitution to redefine marriage as anything but the exclusive union of one man and one woman, I believe uh, that it would still be immoral, illegal, and unconstitutional because there is no higher law than God's law and God's word. God has explicitly defined marriage as the union of one man and one woman, and uh, any law or court order, or excuse me, court opinion that is contrary to God's law is no law at all. This isn't Greg Jackson saying this. Doug, you and I spoke earlier earlier this week. Uh, uh, This is St. Augustine. This is St. Thomas Aquinas. This is Blackstone. Uh, This is Lex Rex, uh, Samuel Rutherford, who wrote Lex Rex. This is Martin Luther King. This is the vast majority of the framers and the founding fathers of this country all knew that our rights come from God, that governments are instituted to protect those God-given rights, and that any law contrary to God's law is no law at all. So therefore, I, I would say that even in any state that legislatively attempts to redefine marriage in any way, shape, or form is acting illegally, immorally, and unconstitutionally. But having said that, it's at least, at the very least, guys, if 47 governors of 47 of the straight states said, thanks for your opinion, you black robe tyrants, but we're going to reject it because it's immoral and unconstitutional. We're not going to give it any credence. And, in fact, we're going to call for your impeachment because no judge at any level of the judiciary possesses the constitutional, legal, or moral authority to issue 
any opinion that is contrary to the Constitution and the word of Almighty God. Period. Amen. Hmm. So here's what I can I can I encourage your your listeners with with something because I, I know Nathan is coming on the show. I don't want to eat <laughs> yeah, into too uh, much of his time, but I want to I want to leave your we need, your listeners. We need encouragement. Well, I, I want to encourage the Hagman and Hagman family because if you're a you know just the past week, Joe and Doug, think about it. What do we have? We have. Your get your guest, your phenomenal guest last night. By the way, if you didn't hear last night's show, you got to listen to it. You have to listen to it on Jade Helm. Um, and you're probably going to have to listen to it twice. Um, but, but number two, we've had the Supreme Court ruling that, again, Obamacare is constitutional, which we all know it's not. Totally unconstitutional, wicked and immoral, should be rejected by every state. And say, what are you going to do about it? John Roberts, what are you going to do about it, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Come and get me. We're not. It's not the law in Colorado or Pennsylvania or Texas. Uh, but if you think about the landscape and everything that's coming down, it can get very, very depressing. Today, I was kind of, I was depressed. I'll admit it. But then I had a, I had a discussion with Chance and John this morning, and and John sent me, I love those guys, and Chance. It was great because it was we were encouraging one another, and chance here I got I got it right here. He sent me this text that that a friend of his shared with him to encourage him, and I I'd like and I hope John doesn't mind or Chance doesn't mind that I'm doing this. I don't think he would. I'd like to share it with the Hagman and Hagman family because I think it really goes to the heart of where our focus needs to be and why we need to be encouraged and. As you and I said before the show, Doug, these are both the most distressing times, but also the most exciting times. And oftentimes God juxtaposes. Think of uh, uh, giving birth for any of you out there that have had a baby. It's scary. It's stressful, especially if it's your first, but it's also exciting, right? Mm-hmm. And I believe that's where we're at, the beginning of birth pangs. It's it's somewhat scary, but like a roller coaster ride, same deal, right? You get up and you're anticipating and you're a little scared, and you go down, it's exhilarating. I believe this is the ride that the Lord has in store for those who are saved, who have placed their faith in Jesus, who are saved, because when you have that, you have everything. This is what Chance sent to me. It says, the light of God will now shine brighter. A friend of his shared this with him. It's not from the Bible, but he just said, the light of God will now shine brighter in his people who will stand for his ways. Take joy in knowing that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is laying out a dividing line. And woe to those who sit on the fence. The sword of his mouth will divide the church from the church. And the church, the first church is bold, italics, capitals, and then the second church is that I spoke of is in all small letters. We love you guys and pray for you and your ministry. Ezekiel 9.4, he said, this was a, a, a friend of Chance's. You send this to Chance, and I wanted to share it with the Hagman and Hagman family so that you would be encouraged. And I also wanted to share very briefly Psalm 2 and just a portion of it. Let's go to God's Word. Why are the nations, because this, this goes exactly to where I believe we were at today, June 26, 2015. And the psalmist says, why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away the cords from us, their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger, meaning the Lord's anger, and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, and today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance. And the very ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. 
Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And to that I say amen and amen and amen. Because when you have the Lord Jesus, when you are covered by the blood of the Lamb, when you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, you already have the victory. And we were already told by the psalmist that all of the plans of man, Jade Helm, five judges that think that they can redefine what God himself has already defined. You know what God does with that, Joe and Doug? He laughs. He <laughs>, laughs. He who sits in the heavens laughs. So, if, look, if your Abba Father, if your Heavenly Father can laugh, we've got to take time and laugh, too. Not that these are, these are serious times, don't get me wrong, we, but we also need to take time to, to, to understand, to be in the Word and to understand God is still sovereign, God is under control, all that he asks from us is to be good stewards, to be obedient to his word, and to pray to the, to the Lord, Lord, how would you use me in these last days to reach others for the kingdom? And to be about our Father's business, which is what your show is all about, which is what all of your guests who come on, your show are all about encouraging, lifting up, informing the saints what the churches should be doing, Joe and Doug, but they've abdicated that duty. What most fathers are supposed to do, but they've unfortunately abnegated that, that duty and that authority. My wife asked me today, you know, why, why can't people just behave? Why, are, why is all this happening? I said, because we've rejected the one true God. It's that simple. If we just turn to him and, and, and be on our knees and, 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 and beg for forgiveness, and, and acknowledge our sins before the Lord. I believe he could heal our land overnight. But that hasn't happened. In fact, the opposite has happened. And I believe that we're being given over to judgment, Romans chapter 1, and it's going to increase. And now, you, you and I talked about it earlier this week, Doug, it's time to prepare for persecution. But in doing so, knowing that the darker that this world gets, the lighter our lights are going to shine. And that Very should well give people that should encourage people's hearts. Yes. I hope it does. It it does. The perspective, the contextual perspective, indeed it does. We have to know that we're already fighting from a position of victory. You're absolutely right. Mm. Wow. So today, yeah, so Joe and Doug, look, I know we've got to wrap it up here, and, and Nathan's coming. I pray for, for a phenomenal show for Nathan and, and for all the Hagman Hagman listeners. Guys, uh, if, if I could give you any, any advice, is those of you who are saved, be encouraged in the Lord. Draw closer to him. Be in the Word like you've never been in the Word before. And be in fellowship with other believers like you've never been in fellowship with other believers before. And pray to the Lord, how, how, Lord, would you use me? Whose path can you put me on today so that our plans are flexible and that we are willing servants to do the Lord's will in these last days? And if you're not saved, I want to just one more time, maybe you listen to Joe and Doug and you listen to some of their guests and it's titillating, it's good information, but you're not saved. Tomorrow is not promised. And the most important decision you will ever make, and it's no, it, there's no coincidence that you're listening to my voice tonight on this show. Today is the day of salvation. And if, if you've never repented of your sins and received the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, may tonight be the night. That is my prayer for any unsaved soul in the Hagman and Hagman audience, because guess what? Tomorrow is not promised. If you die in your sleep and you're not saved, there's no second chances. I'm not saying that there's no deathbed conversions and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the Bible is very clear. When you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not by works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says. It's by, by, by faith we are saved through grace 
through Christ alone, by God's grace alone, through our through faith alone. And tonight, I would just pray that it would just be, even if it's one person around the world, you're listening in London, England, or wherever you're listening around the world, and you haven't made that decision, all this information is important, but none of it matters unless you're saved. And if you've, if you've never given your life to, to the Lord Jesus, may tonight be the night, and all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I admit, I, I, I acknowledge that I'm, I'm sinful, I'm a sinner, I've fallen short, I've lied, I've stolen, I've cheated, I've, I've looked at another woman lustfully, I've, I've committed sin. And I understand that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, to pay that penalty, to pay the price, so that I would be justified freely by placing my faith in you and receiving your death on that cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And when you do that, folks, you are, you are justified. You are saved by faith. And the rest of the journey, you're, you're sanctified. You grow in your faith. But the Bible says that we are, we are at the very moment that we place our faith in the Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 1, seals us. And so to, let today be the day of salvation, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, I pray for the whole Hagman and Hagman audience worldwide. And Joe and Doug, thank you so much for giving me this time. I love Greg, you guys. I, I so appreciate thank you. it. You guys, are, you guys are just incredible. I love you. Um, I, I, I and, and, and I um, just want to say that, you know, you guys are an inspiration to so many people. I pray that you guys would have the courage and the strength to just keep on keeping on humbly serving the Lord as you do. And that many souls would be won to the kingdom through your show. Ultimately, that's all that matters. That's the most important thing. And I believe it's so encouraging to hear your show and to hear you guys every night. You guys are doing it. Keep running the race. And finish strong. Greg, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, kind of coming from you, that means a lot. God bless you, my friend. Have a great weekend. Thank you for, thank you for uh, your time tonight on this very Absolutely. somber occasion. But uh, in, indeed, we have hope. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. That, Be encouraged. Uh, amen, brother. Thank you. God bless right. you, my friend. Love you guys. All right. Love you too. Bye, Bye guys. Wow, oh, you know, it, it, Greg is right, and folks, you know, we we can't. Um, it, it's we we have to turn to America's coach uh, uh, from a strategy point of view. Uh, America's coach, being Coach Dave Dobmeyer, Salt and Light Brigade dot org. Uh, very uh, uh, articulate men like Greg Jackson, uh, men of uh, the cloth like. Uh, uh, um, Pastor Langford, Steve Quayle. And guests you know, like we have on now. Oh, and we do have our guest on. Okay, this is great. Folks, let me, uh, before Nathan comes on, I just want to say this. Yesterday we had a, a DJ on. Uh, she was on J.B. Wells' program on episode 309 and uh, presented a lot of information. She she really did present quite a bit of information. But i got to tell you something. I went back. Yeah, today, this afternoon, I looked back through of, of the times that Nathan Leal was on. And if you go back to January 22nd of this year, and forward from there, talking about Jade Helm, the amount of research that Nathan Leal has done, his research, independent research, is just is far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. And I was looking at a specific aspect of Nathan's work. You know, and in fact, if you go to Hagman and Hagman .com, um tonight's lead story or lead uh, news article is about Nathan and about his work. I got to, I got to thinking about last night and all the times we talked about Jade Helm with, with uh, people in law enforcement, people and the secular people. The missing component, folks, is the Christian aspect the miss, missing component? Is the um, the dots that need to be connected that Nathan has connected and continues to connect with respect to Jade Helm? I would urge everyone to go to HagmanHagman.com and click on the click on the 
article, Nathan Leal on Jade Helm 15, in the context of biblical prophecy. Because you see, what, what uh, Nathan Leal has, has written, what he has said, is that Jaden Helm is a manifestation of a new direction for America in the U.S. military. It will play a role in fulfilling Bible prophecy at the of the end times feast. And that's exactly... In that context, that's exactly how we have to analyze Jade Helm 15. No one, no one I know has done that better or more adeptly than Nathan Leal. Joe? Nathan, it's great to have you back on the show. It sounds like you got a lot of papers in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always, I always have a lot of papers in front of me. That's, sounds like that's me. how I keep my thoughts together. Because <laughs> otherwise I can't do it. Too much information. Well, you know what, uh, Nathan? I, I just I, again I want to I want to say that how much I respect your research. You know, uh, I, I went through today. I went through your your website after you and I spoke. My goodness, the amount of information, the links, the background, the detail, folks. Please go to watchmanscry. dot com. It's linked off of our website, and, and go back. Really, starting from January twenty second forward, take a look. Follow, uh, open the articles. Follow the links. He has uh, visuals there. He has excruciatingly detailed, uh, painstakingly uh, detailed information about Jane Helm, and this all from a Christian and biblically sound perspective. And I just want to say thank you so much for the time that you put into this. You know, we could talk all day long about quantum computing, but at the end of the day, when it's not contextually put in the context of, of biblical prophecy in the Scripture, it really is a hollow. It's hollow. And you've really managed to fill that void, and I want to thank you for that. So with that, Nathan... My goodness, here we are on the 26th of June. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. Indeed. And, gentlemen, thank you for having me on. You know, Doug, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Praise God. There's a lot more information out there to glean. And Anyway, that's I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people, one of the many out there that are all working together. We're we're all working together, and I appreciate your program that you bring people that are contributing a piece of the puzzle, and and that's the bottom line. The we have the pieces of the puzzle that are in the natural, but indeed we have to include and look at the perspective from all dimensions, which is what you do bring to the table. And I appreciate you offering the privilege for people to do that. And today, Doug, I have several things I want to touch on. But I want to first start out by, you know, I, I'm not even sure if I, I've i processed it all the way, what happened today with the Supreme Court. But over the last few hours, I have just been thinking about it, and I've been lamenting. I've been sad. My wife has been weeping on and off during the day because she knows what this means. And that's the thing that, when we include the spiritual aspect of what time it is, then we can see the big picture of of the ramifications of the continual events happening in the United States worldwide with legislation and just all the things that are happening are going to affect our future. And I wrote up my thoughts, my heart, and I placed it on my website, and it's called I Grieve. And I just want to Share it right now, Doug? Please, yes, I read and it. Yes, please. You read it? Okay, yeah. and I, I would hope that the listeners would really, really understand what this means. And, and I was trying to pen from my heart what it meant, but let me just read it. I grieve. Today, in light of the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage, I grieve. I grieve because the land of my youth has died. I grieve because I know what the blasphemous ruling means. I grieve because five 
unelected ones decided the fate of the nation and legalized the abominable. I grieve because my children have been handed the baton of a moral cesspool. I grieve because I know how dark it is going to become. I grieve because in my heart of hearts I know that God, our Creator, who abides in the real Supreme Court, is going to respond with His ruling. And it's going to be a ruling that's going to plow the land under. The God of heaven looked down at the mockery of humans and allowed them to choose. They chose, and now America is going to crumble. They chose, and now America will burn. They chose, and now a plague will dine on the people. They chose, and those who celebrate will become the meal of demons. They chose, and now darkness will overtake with unrelenting madness. They chose to throw away God's law, and with it, the lamp of the eye. So, ladies and gentlemen, today... June 26, 2015, the time has arrived to be afraid. Be afraid for your family. Be afraid for your loved ones. Be afraid for the future. Be afraid because foolish men have stoked the fires of the wrath of God. Be afraid because the thread of God's patience has been severed by the blade of lustful men. Be afraid, because the foundry of heaven is forging the weapons of war and sharpening the battle axe of the destroyer. Be afraid, O people, for the appointment is coming. Weep for the losses. Grieve for the fallen. And cry out to your Creator and plead with Him that the coming plague of bloodshed will pass over you and your dwelling place. Today, the nation turned a corner. Today she left her path and walked into a graveyard. The tombstones watched. The keepers of the crypts laughed, and the jaws of hell opened wide to dine on the coming meal. The time of talk is over. The time to pray pray that America will turn has passed. She has chosen not to be healed. Her fate has been determined. So save yourselves and hide in the rock of Christ because the fires are coming. And lament. And those are some words that I share from my heart, Doug. And they are not only from my heart. I believe they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, because this is what time it really is. We can look at the things happening in America, and when we look at them single-handedly, one by one, you know, we can pick any event, whether it's Jade Helm or this thing. But when we put them all on the table... And then we look at them through the lens of spiritual reality, because there is a spiritual reality, ladies and gentlemen. When we look at it through that lens, then there can be no denying that an appointment has been made with America and with this world. Doug and Joe and listeners, some things are coming. Because of what happened today, that's that's going to seal the fate. We're we're done hoping for the revival that's going to turn this thing around. It's not going to turn around. Now, Maybe in the ashes of misery and heartache and grief, maybe through the tears of, of the fallen, maybe at the gravesides when people are looking at the horror that has come upon America, maybe at that point people's hearts will be broken and softened to turn to God. But right now they won't do it. And that is what it's going to take, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to take America burning before America turns. So Doug and Joe, this is what we're facing When we look at Jade Helm and we look at all the other stories that are real popular and and get a lot of people's attention, if we just limit our viewpoint to, hey, look what's coming, look what they're doing, but we leave out the big picture, we're going to be missing our homework. And the people will be missing their assignment. Because, Because of what happened today, ladies and gentlemen, we have homework to do. And Doug and Joe... The reality of, of, of the matter and the reality of what time it is and the reality of the schedule for America and the schedule and the appointment and the destiny for every person listening is that every, every person has a destiny. Every person has an appointment, and so they need to find out what it is in the light of God's will. They need to find out what to do because of what time it is. If people are just looking at the news and and wondering, you know, when is it going to start? When is it going to start? And every day they pour their coffee and they go to the Drudge or Steve Quell's side and read the news or your side or mine and just read the news 
and wonder when is it going to happen, but do nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't say this enough. You will not be ready. And Doug and Joe, for the people that are not ready, there's going to be a body count. There have been too many voices. There have been too many visions. There have been too many glimpses that God has tried to warm and plead with the people that there is going to be a body count. It's going to be horrible what's coming. And the reason is not because we have a, a misfit president or some guy that took over the White House from Kenya and so shame on the Democrats and saying that they snuck him in. That is not why it's happening. It's happening because of things like what today, the, the moral cesspool, the, the moral depravity, the, the denial of God, the denial of his principles and his statutes. That's what time it is. That's where we are. And how sad is it that in the midst of this mess that we're in, America continues to drive the, the, wet, the, the nails into her own heart. But that's where we are. They celebrated and they cheered their death today. The gay and lesbian agenda had a victory. It's temporary, but they had a victory. And they cheered as if this was going to take America to the next evolution of, of perfection, which is nonsense. <laughs> this is just sealing the fate of what's coming. And America right now has blinders on. America's under a spell. And sadly, even amongst the listening audience, Doug and Joe, Ladies and gentlemen, some of you, this applies to some of you. While I give the message today, Doug, let me just go ahead and forecast right now. While I am going to give some very important information, you're going to have knuckleheads in the chat room arguing over nonsense, arguing over things that don't matter when their hearts are not even ready with God. And as I have looked at the temperature of the quote-unquote remnant that's out there, I see that the remnant's not ready. The patriots aren't ready. Those who want to get, who are preppers and survivalists and they have all their bug out food and they're, they're keeping their powder dry, they are not ready. And I cannot say this enough, but sadly, the end result is going to be what has been destined and what has already proven itself through the history of man, and that is this, Doug. It's funner to stay in the flesh than to seek God. So today I'm going to talk about what time it is. I'm going to talk about how serious the situation is. I'm going to talk about what people should be thinking about, and what they should be doing. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you can, if you care, if you care, I, I want to qualify this, if you care about the spiritual condition of your house and to make sure that it's in order, then please listen to this program. If you don't care, then just goof off and, and play with it. But, Doug and Joe, I cannot mince my words. I'm not here to sugarcoat, and I'm not here to pat everyone on the back and say, good for you. No, it's not good for you. We are in judgment because we haven't been good. We are in judgment because the people of God dropped the ball. We're in judgment because the people of God have become flaky, even the patriots. People can say all they want, God bless America, apple pie, and, and, and baseball, and that's what I am. But, Doug... Words matter nothing in the eyes of God. God's looking at the heart. God wants to see the houses that are taking this thing seriously. And when the destroyer, because there is going to be a destroyer, ladies and gentlemen, invisible creatures, God is going to allow them to walk up and down the streets of this land. And he's going to allow them to wreak havoc. And the only protection that anyone will have will be the homework that you do now, not in the aftermath. Right now, Doug and Joe. So that's my introduction. I am grieving. I am upset. I am mad. I'm sad. And I'm afraid, Doug, because I know what's coming. I know what this means. I have seen the glimpses of what's coming, and it's not good. And if people only knew what was coming, they would take this thing a lot more serious. Now, yeah. I want to I start out by just saying this, Doug. I know that people struggle, so I'm not going to throw rocks at the one struggling. There are some people struggling, and they hate the struggle they're in. They hate their addictions. They don't like having the vices of, of Babylon, and they're trying. I'm not talking about those ones that grieve, and they send me emails and say, Nathan, pray for, pray for me. I'm talking about the ones that are confident in their pretend relationship with God. That's what I'm talking about. So for those that are concerned about their, their household, I want to offer you, There's I have some meals on my website, Doug, over the, I started a new series, and it has to do with the feeding of the 5,000. It has to do with salvation. It has to do with repentance and what Jesus can do for us as his children. There's hope for those 
and, and see, that's the other thing, Doug. I'm not just throwing rocks and saying, shame on you, everybody. I am challenging and saying, come on, get off the pot. Quit pretending. It's time right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to do something about your spiritual life and you want help but you can't find any food, I have it at my website. I have some sermons that I prayed through and, and got a hold of God, and they are there. They, they're a series on the feeding of the 5,000. I have two of them out. I'm about to put out part three. Doug, that's what we need to be doing right now is eating spiritual food. Period. And, 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 and folks, they are fantastic for such a time as this. Jesus, the Bread of Life, a sermon, uh, June 6th, June 17th. Folks, please, please, partake in the meal which Nathan is offering. Trust me, you will you will find uh, great nourishment, spiritual nourishment in his words. Thank you, Nathan. I mean, thank you. Now, I, I know I hit the ground running just now, Doug, but this thing is so pivotal. Mm. What the Supreme Court did. It is so pivotal. It's going to have ramifications. There's going to be events that are going to break out because of this. It's going to give birth to legislation. It's going to give birth to people trying to react. It's going to give birth to a lot of things. It's going to play a huge role. But the biggest role it's going to play is from the court of heaven. When God looks down and sees this nonsense, we already know what he did in the past. Yeah. When man chose their own way of the flesh? Yeah. So, it's a mess, Doug and Joe. We're, we're in trouble. And, of course, we could uh, we could say easily from the mind of the rationale, yeah, I saw it coming. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, okay, but after that, after we've spoken those words, we weren't surprised we saw it coming. Now we got to look at what it means. Because this is going to affect people in the clergy it's going to affect churches it's going to affect christian schools it, um, it, christian colleges people who want to maintain themselves as segregated away from the world because they're christian this is going to mess with all of that and it's going to cause lawsuits it's going to cause people christians pastors who believed that it was wrong and refused in the past to say it was wrong, now it's going to mess with a lot of things. So we are. This is going to affect Christian persecution. It's going to play a huge role. Now, in addition to from that aspect, from the aspect of the clergy, we're also going to possibly see some states rise up against it. And in fact, Texas already responded, and we're going to see some things in the future. And it, I believe, eventually, Doug and Joe, because of those who are well-meaning. The well-meaning ones, the Sons of Liberty, the Patriots, some of them could say, you know what, and they and they want it. They'll try to deal with it from the aspect of the natural. But eventually, we're going to see a civil war break out. That's going to be horrible. And when that thing happens, it's going to be bloody. And I've talked to you about this off the air, Doug. There's a part of me that says, you know what, this nation's so gone. Whatever, bring it on. Let God work out. And, and separate and, and work it out in the aftermath, but just bring it on. Because there's a part of me that, that is so disgusted with where America is now that part of me wants to just throw up my hand and say, God, go ahead. Mm. I'll help you light the match, whatever. You, you know, there's a part of me that feels that way, Doug, but eventually it's going to happen. And I don't want to mean those words because I know how horrible it's going to be, but eventually it's going to be bloodshed and i, I want to share um, a prophetic vision that i just had a few days ago and i don't have all the details yet but i'm going to go ahead and share it in light of what happened with the supreme court so ladies and gentlemen you can write this down and just remember the key details that i'm going to give number one remember the alamo and even remember that statement remember the alamo I had a prophetic glimpse that that's going to play a role in the future, Doug. Remember the Alamo? There's going to be uh, a protest that's going to occur there, San Antonio, and it's going, to, it's going to fall apart and it's going to erupt and it's going to play a role in the big picture of civil war. Civil war, the Alamo is going to – something's going to happen there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that right now so it's on record, Doug. So okay. when it does happen – 
you'll remember. Now, I've been looking at, over the past few days, I've been examining some of the prophetic glimpses God gave me in the past, and, and I've wondered if I entirely saw them with the clarity that I should have. And that's actually an honest question, but the answer usually is no. No one usually has the clarity when they have a prophetic glimpse because we have to work it out. We have to work it through. We have to have God's help, and sometimes it just takes time to understand it. Even when we look at the scriptures, Joseph didn't understand his dream. Any of his brothers bowing to him, he didn't get it. It took decades later. So when I looked back at one that I had in particular, and I reminded you of this, Doug, off the air, but when I was on with Steve Quell in, in January, I believe it was? January 22nd. Yep. Okay, thank you. When we did that program, I shared a prophetic glimpse that I had, and I just want to remind you of it. And I shared several, actually, but this particular one, I, I shared that I was walking on a country road, and a soldier in a Humvee pulled up next to me, and he gave me a ride. You remember that? Oh, yes. I got on his Humvee, and... Uh, he backed up into a cornfield that was chest high, and I rearranged myself on his Humvee. The ground was muddy, but the, the corn, it was corn that was growing, was chest high. And then he went out and, and to the road, took me into town, and then I got off and I had to get home. But when I got off of his Humvee, I walked through the parking lot of a grocery store. And when I was on your program, I said it could have been a Walmart, but there was no cars there. It was empty. There was nothing there. But at the time I shared it, I didn't understand. And in fact, I, I told myself, why would a Walmart not have any cars and why would it be empty? I, I didn't know then. And see, that shows how we don't really know. We, The glass is kind of fuzzy. But that's what I saw. And I shared that. It's on record. It was a grocery store or a Walmart. I mentioned Walmart, and I said there was no cars there. But after I was walking into the parking lot, when I set foot in the parking lot of an empty Walmart, immediately... From the other end of the, from the road, hundreds and hundreds of people came up on top of the, the parking lot. They entered the parking lot walking, and all of these people had weapons. They had guns. From the youngest child to the oldest, they had 22s and deer rifles, etc. And these people were ready for a fight. They were ready for, to react. And and then I had to get home, and, and the dream was over. So, so I shared that dream, and I said. Uh, I, I think that at some point, again, the Civil War is coming and the people are going to react. But what I didn't take note of was the Walmart, the empty Walmart in the dream. So I, I don't know, Doug. I'm not sure if that coincides with the closed Walmarts now. I'm not saying it does. I don't know. But I did see it, and it's on record. So what I'm wondering is when I look at that glimpse, if I was in an empty Walmart parking lot, but then instantly you have all these people that are reacting, I am wondering if – because of the frenzy of rumors, and I see what time it is at the top of the hour, and we'll finish this on the other side, but with the frenzy of rumors, and there's a lot of them, I'm wondering if some of those rumors, whether they're true or not, that part doesn't matter, but I'm wondering if they're going to play a role in to get this thing started. In other words, I'm concerned that they're baiting the people to react and then it's once if one person reacts, that thing's going to go live, and we're going to be there. So whatever it took to do it, it's going to happen. So anyway, I'm sharing that. The reason I'm sharing it is because it was people reacting. The citizens were reacting. And then with what I saw just a few days ago at the Alamo, I don't know what that means. I don't know if something's going to happen in Texas, if they're going to say they want to secede. or I don't know. But I'm, I'm just sharing that right now, Doug and Joe. But when we look at the civil war that's coming, the civil war is going to play out because when you look biblically at history in Scripture, when God judged the land and the people didn't know what to do, most of the time they reacted in a, in a frenzy of chaos without the guidance of God. And even though there was a man of God trying to encourage them and tell them what to do, the majority of the time they didn't listen. They did it their own way. So it played out, and the end result is usually the same. They try to react on their own, with their own strength, and every time they fail, because without God, there is no way you can succeed. So that's what we're looking at right now, ladies and gentlemen. On the other side of the, the hour, Doug, I'm going to talk about the coming Civil War, and the theme of tonight's program is what to do when you don't 
know what to do because <laughs> I want to challenge everybody to find out their appointment. That's our homework, ladies and gentlemen. Doug and Joe, we have to know what God's will is for us, not for somebody else, and and not just because someone says it on a YouTube or in an article. We need to find God's will right now because because of what happened today, we, we entered the next level. And the next level is going to have an aftermath. It's going to have a body count, and people are going, going to fall. It's, good. it's going to get ugly. It's going to get horrible, and we got to get ready. we got to start getting ready now, Doug and Joe. So that's my introduction. I see we're at the top of the hour. Do you want me to stop or keep going? Or Well, this is a good place to stop, Nathan, and I just want to say thank you so much for your um your your position, your expose, your thoughts, I grieve, and and I've got to tell the uh, tell you and the audience, you know, Nathan. To it, Nathan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you start the second hour wherever you'd like. All right, thank you. Um, I was just reading one of the reports about this ruling, and there was something real interesting that was stated by Obama and. At this point, I don't know, gentlemen, if it's prophetic, but in a way, it's kind of spooky. Because in the the report from Yahoo, let me just read this. It said, President Barack Obama responding publicly at the White House to the decision for the second consecutive day heralded the landmark decision, stating that justices definitely reaffirm that all Americans are entitled to equal protection under the law. Our nation... Quote, quote, this is his words, our nation was founded on a bedrock principle that we are all created equal. Now let me just pause right there and give my commentary. That's blasphemous because we were not founded that homosexuality, the abominable act of sodomites, makes us equal. That's not true. But he went on, the pro- project of each generation is to bridge the meaning of those founding words with the realities of changing times. Now, that part's true. We're progressive, and we've diminished in our, our moral compass. With the realities of changing times, a never-ending quest to ensure that those words ring true for every single American. Progress on this journey often comes in small increments, Obama said. And, gentlemen, make note of this. Sometimes there are days like this when that slow, steady effort is rewarded with justice that arrives like a lightning bolt or a thunderbolt. Huh. From the words of Obama. Good like catch. a thunderbolt. So, you know, Doug, there, we, we've looked at what the meaning of the word Barack Obama is. Yeah. We have lightning in there, thunder in there. Yeah. There's people that have done the studies. How uh, that's kind of weird, isn't it? It's kind of spooky. it's <laughs> you know I, I don't believe in accidents or coincidences, and th- that's um, my goodness, <laughs> but, yeah. The words uh, the words that were chosen, prophetic, man, meaningful, indeed. So, uh, anyway, during the break, Doug, I uh, had to gather myself because I, you know, I, I really am upset right now. I, anyway, what, what you said about your wife and my wife, you know, she was making breakfast, weeping, and over breakfast she was weeping, and all day long she's been weeping, and I, and I said, are you okay? And and she said, yeah, but what about our kids? Exactly. And, and that's the thing, Doug. What about our children? What about our grandkids? This is Boy. what we're... Is this is the legacy we're giving them? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, uh, the our progeny, are, are, are they going to ask us, where were you? What did you do to stop this abomination that you knew was coming? You allowed us to inherit this. What have you done to stop it? Or to try to stop it, or to mitigate the damage. So, are, are they, are our, are, are our children and their children, are they going to 
look upon us with contempt? Or are they going to look upon us and say, you know, you did everything you could. And more importantly, when we stand at the final, at, at, you know, before the throne, are we going to have to explain our inaction? Or will, are we going to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant? But you're right, uh, Nathan. You're right, and, and it's um, and, and people to see people celebrating this abomination. It's not about folks. It's not about equal rights. It's not about it's. It has nothing to do with what they say it has to do with. No, and, and I want to reiterate this because I talked about this uh, before this decision came down, uh, and I was right that. Uh, I was more upset at the churches changing the definition of marriage inside uh, the different denominations before the Supreme Court even ruled on it. To me, that was the nail in the coffin. It, the Supreme Court ruling on it made no difference. The churches took the initiative and spearheaded it and made it their doctrine before the United States courts Indeed, they did. changed it. Yeah. And we've seen that in biblical history as well. The the priests and the prophets dropped the ball, and they no longer told the people the truth because they didn't have the truth in, within them also. And that's another that would be another program. That's one of the things I talk about often and that you talk about often is how the church has changed just over the past few years, how darkness has now infiltrated the church. But that's another message, and, and your your listeners know that. They know. That's why most of them don't even go to church anymore. They get their food from sources like you and my sermons. Like so. you. And, yeah, I mean, it, it's you, you, the churches have have acquiesced and, and compromised. Uh, they're tolerating evil, and uh, under the guise of of tolerance, it's it's a tolerate the, the, the tolerating evil, which is inexcusable. And you know, it uh, Nathan. Um, what is that house or the, uh, the judgment of God begins in you know in the house right in the house and, of the and, Lord right. yeah you know and I just I, so, so many things you said uh, tonight already just have, have really uh, hit me pretty hard including uh, well that narrative was great but but also something about the, what you said about the Alamo. Uh, Nathan, I don't know. It just it just resonates with me, and uh, there's something that, that there's something about that. So I, I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent there. But, uh, oh, and, and let me just say this uh, to, to those people out there, to the Mark Levins, to the uh, Rush Limbaugh, to the Sean Hannitys, to the, to the people who have really sold themselves out. When we were talking about the constitutional el constitutional eligibility of Barack Hussein Obama. Yeah, uh, Barry Satara. When we were talking about his uh, eligibility and allegiance, and uh, it, you all said it was a distraction. Well, um, you know, uh, look, I'm not going to say it would have been any different with any other person in the White House, but I'll say this: um, his in the, in the, the fact that you considered it a distraction uh, and, and mocked us for questioning who this man was, mocked us for for. For this, uh, to me, uh, you've got blood on your hands. You've got, uh, you've got the. Uh, well, I, I, that's all right. I, I, I just, I don't know. Go ahead, Nathan. Let's uh, let's rock into this here. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're have the ability to take notes, or if you don't, just listen to this program again, and please think about what I'm gonna share tonight because I'm going to offer some suggestions but even the, even with me offering them you take them to God in prayer and discuss them with your loved ones because everyone needs to figure out their own appointment because that's the bottom line Doug and I'm going to show that from scriptures we all have a different destiny every one of us so in light of that since we do that means that we need to decide how we're going to walk through our destiny and our appointment. And as I stated earlier, there's a tendency among so many of the well-meaning, those who are awake, 
to daily. They're addicted to finding out, okay, what happened today? But at some point, Doug, we're going to go from its approach to its presence and then the aftermath of the event. So while it's happening and then in the aftermath, if people are spending all their time wondering when it's coming and then when it starts and then we're in the aftermath, they won't be ready. So the assignment has homework. And that means that we need to be thinking about the big picture and and the, the large scope of how it's going to play out. There is a plan for everyone, and there's also a formula that exists, and if the formula is not followed, then fear, panic, depression will take over a person while they're waiting. So if we were to examine the, the situation here in America right now and compare it to Judah's situation when they got invaded by Babylon, you know, when we look at the book of Jeremiah, Babylon showed up in chapter 39 after 40 years of, of Jeremiah warning them. They finally showed up, but the people of Jerusalem sealed up the gates, and they tried to ride it out. But Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, I, I guess I could leave, but I don't think so. I need to make an example of them. So Nebuchadnezzar parked himself and camped outside the walls of Jerusalem, and for a year and a half he started building siege walls and ramps and they cut down things in the forest, trees in the forest, and they built the catapults and all those things that they do in those movies that we see, the siege works. And for a year and a half he prepared, and then he bust through the walls. So when we look at the invasion of a country from the biblical point of view, there is always the warning portion of it, and the warning portion takes the longest because Jeremiah warned for 40 years. And during the warning portion, there's going to be people who doubt or to say, you know, I don't believe you, or I do believe you, or where is it, or, you know, they're wondering, but they're still not getting ready. But the warning portion takes the longest. So for Jeremiah, it it was through five administrations of kings, five. And 40 years went by, four decades, and then finally he showed up. Nebuchadnezzar was outside the wall, and then the siege occurred. That lasted a year and a half. So then when there's no doubt that you're in trouble, when Jerusalem looked out over the walls and saw that they were surrounded, they they couldn't doubt Jeremiah any longer at that point. And at that point, they had to start taking inventory of, whoa, how are we going to survive this? Because we only have as much water and food as we had when the, the gates were shut. And for a year and a half, they starved as they slowly ran out of food. And a lot of people died in a famine inside the walls. So when we look at America, we have the warning portion and then the the portion where we're surrounded and it's obvious that we're in trouble. And then the, the, the next phase happens where they bust through the walls, which is what happened in Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar entered. And then there was from the year and a half misery of starving and people trying to survive. And we can read about that account in the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah talks about it. He says, children that I held in my hands when they were born, they pined away to nothing, and mothers held them in their arms, and they died of starvation. And God, why are you doing this to us? And and Jeremiah was very upset. He wept a lot as he saw people die. But that was a, a, a level of misery. That was one of the phases. And some people could have thought, well, it can't get any worse, but it did get worse because when the gates were busted open by Nebuchadnezzar, he then came in with the soldiers, and they started whacking everybody and burning the, the town down, dismembering, raping the women. So from starvation, then it went into invasion. So that was the next phase. And then after that, and a bunch of people died, by the way. So you have several purgings. When we look at the initial warning phase, no one's dying. They're just complaining to Jeremiah, saying he's a liar. But then when they're surrounded and people are starving, then you start having people die. So that's the first purge. And then when Babylon came in and started killing people, that was the second purge. And then he took people captive. The majority of the citizens he took captive and took them off to Babylon. So now they're slaves. So then it got worse from that aspect. And then Nebuchadnezzar allowed some to remain behind, but it was a very small number of people, very small. And if we have time, we're going to look at the scriptures that describe that. But... Over the course of several months, that small remaining remnant then started behaving in various manners. 
but the majority of them still, even after Jeremiah had proven to himself to be a man of God and a voice of God and the the agenda from God and the appointment from God with the instructions from God, even in the aftermath, they didn't listen to him. So the purging continued, and they were whittled down even from that point. So the purging has several phases, and each time it happens, the amount of survivors grows smaller and smaller. You have less people that made it, and the majority of the reason was because they didn't listen to the man of God or the wisdom of God or the counsel of God. So what I want to say tonight, Doug and Joe and listeners, is that history has not changed as far as human nature. And when we look at the downfall of America that's coming and the siege that's coming and the invasion and all the mess that I just described that Jerusalem went through, you have a choice. You will have a choice. How are you going to walk through it? But right now you need to choose which side you're going to be on. You need to choose right now whether you're going to just be full of fluff and talk and claim to be a person of God that you may or may not be. But the truth of your words is going to play out in reality. And, Doug, I can't stress that enough. The people that are pretenders are going to end up in the perch, period. When we look at the natural warnings and some of the weird spooky warnings, for example, the Deagle website that's now offline, but most of your listeners know about this. Doug, you've talked about it. We've talked about it. That Deagle website had a prediction, was it 2013 or, or 2023 or 25? Was it 10 years away? The future was, of America, the population? Yeah, uh, I, I thought it was 2025. I, I don't know. I, uh, that could be Something wrong. like that, right? 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And and the the prediction on that website was that most of the West was going to dwindle in population, depending on the, the country. The percentages would, would be different. But the largest, one of the largest percentages out of the entire planet was the United States because it said we had 300-plus million, and we're going to go down to 65, something like that, right? 63, 65, right. and some change. million people in the next 10 years. Right. If that is if that is a foreshadowing made on a, a estimation of some someone having fun with their website, that's one thing. But that website actually has existed long enough. I believe Tom Clancy even used it for some of his reference material, and – Based on what we have found out, it's more than just some nerd having fun with the website. It looked like they were projecting the actual future of the world. And if that's right. the case, Doug, the question needs to be asked, well, okay, if we're going to go from 330 million to 65 million, what happened to all the other people? What method is, are they going to use to dwindle the population? What events are going to happen? So those are logical questions, and I submit this ladies and gentlemen, that whether or not that website is true, it still is following a pattern of what we see prophetically coming to the world and to the United States, and that is this. The United States is going to go through a horrible, horrible period of time. Indeed. And the and population no, is going to be purged. Right. And, and even, if you, even if you're not uh, resting your uh, – even if you think that uh, that website was – um whatever uh, there's enough extraneous evidence uh to to support the fact that uh, there will be a culling of, of the population exactly so Doug and Joe I want to throw this question out and I I'm not sure of the answer really I'm not I'm I'm just a watchman on the wall and and I I've seen it from the start to the finish and not just me there's uh, many others that have God is using a lot of different people, men, women, old, young, children, to to see glimpses, as well as people that just know, as well as people who are smart and can see the writing on the wall. There's a lot of people crying out that this thing is coming. But my question is this, Doug and, and Joe: Where are we in the timeline of a of a siege, a siege that Jerusalem went through? Are we in the warning phase? Are are we starting to be surrounded by Babylon, or, or are we surrounded? Are the siege works firing catapult cannons at us? Are, are they pounding the walls? And You know, Nathan, after we spoke uh, off air, 
I, I was thinking about that. I contend that uh, we have already accepted the Trojan horse inside the Trojan horses inside our uh, uh, our gates, and the the outer wall has been breached. What we saw is a storm cloud um, oncoming, you know, uh, a dust cloud uh, that is now uh, moved up. Uh, uh, right to the gate so we've got uh, an internal breach we've got internal infiltration and the enemy is inside as well as at our gate and i would agree with that doug indeed the the trojan horse came through with obama and his minions and all that mess and they're going opening the back door like the joker supposed story in, in colorado they opened the exit door and in came the next phase but yep what when it does come through, when the next phase comes through the walls, when will it happen is the big question that a lot of people wonder about, and what is it going to be, and what are the potential events? Well, just a short list could be a dollar crash, uh, a, a false flag, an EMP, Jade Helm, Civil War, a, a race war, a world war, or natural events, a planetary event, uh, a plague, Planet X. It could be a number of them, it could be some of them simultaneous. It could be some of them happening in 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 an order, so that God chooses. So we do know that these things are coming, Doug. I have absolutely no doubt, and neither do you, uh, Joe. You, you have no doubt. We know that this is the big picture. It's going to happen. So because we know it's going to happen, this is the challenge that I want to throw out, and and I want I, I, I'm trying to challenge the people to think outside the box. But I want to leave you with this, ladies and gentlemen, to think about. While we are trying to guess, to try to estimate and figure out what's coming, please, please include a plan for yourself and for your family. Because it's not just enough to know. Out there on the Internet, Doug and Joe, we already know this. There's a lot of rumors. I mean, there is so many rumors, and based on the, the people who make the YouTubes or the articles that we read, and there's a lot of articles out there from a lot of well-meaning people. And, and some of the articles are pretty spooky. Some of them sound almost crazy. Some of them sound sensational. But whatever the information is, I would estimate that some of the articles, Doug, are from well-meaning people that are afraid. They're scared, and because they have not arrived at the place in their life to put things in the proper perspective spiritually, they're just trying to shout. And some of them are shouting a little loud, and some of them are not using the proper research and vetting techniques, but whatever it is, they're trying, and I want to give them that. Right. Now, in the past, I've talked to you about being frustrated that you know they're not trying or they're not using proper research techniques, but... I want to get past that and just throw them a bone and say that they're trying, because I know they are. But in the midst of that formula, in the midst of that situation, ladies and gentlemen, some of you have read some articles over the past few days, past few weeks, the rumors. Like Jade Helm has so many rumors, Doug. Some of them are true. Some are, have portions that are true. Some are taking some regular things, like military movements of, of machinery. That's always happened. And they're wondering if that's part of Jade Helm, because they're scared. And rightfully right. so. And then you have the, the Walmarts that have shut down, and people wonder why, what's going on, and, you know, is it legit, is it not? And, and it's scary, Doug. And that's the other thing that does happen when people do not have the right perspective is fear can drive them, and fear can be the motivator and, and ha cause them to lose the proper focus. But while that's happening, it's having an effect on, on the, our listeners. It's having an effect on... The listeners to your program, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that are hearing my voice right now, you know it's true. Some of you hear the reports and you get scared and you say, "Is it true?" Or I got a, can it be? Or and, and the response is the response from some of the listeners is all over the map. Some some of them get scared also when they hear the information, or some of them dismiss it, or some of them say that that's just insane. There's no way, and they get angry. But the thing that can work negatively is that some of the response can cause people to either 
check out and say, you know what, this is so sensational. I don't want to listen to it anymore because it's dumb. It's, there's no way. And so they just say it's silly or their loved ones that they share their warnings with make fun of them because it sounds so sensational. So the response can be painful for, the, for some that are trying to warn. But in that response, whether it's painful or not, how many are doing the homework that I'm recommending? So that's what I want to, to uh, challenge the listeners with. Ladies and gentlemen, while you are pouring yourself the morning coffee and you read the news of the rumors, a lot of you are wondering to yourself, how much time do we have? Is this one it? Is it going to happen this week? Is it tomorrow? Is it on this date? Is it the July 15th? Is it going to happen in the month of the Shemitah, the September? Is it the election? Is there going to be an election? That's another thing, Doug. There's a lot of oh, sure. opinions. Yeah. There's a lot of voices, but that's fair. I, I will throw that out there. That's fair because it, it, we are in unsure times, and the Bible even says there will be wars and rumors, quote-unquote, of war. So in the midst of the rumors, this is the thing that can derail the motives of well-meaning people. The rumors can overcome somebody so that they become paralyzed and they do nothing, including prepare themselves spiritually. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to... That's the theme of tonight. What do you do while you're waiting for the the big tamale t- to arrive, for the next phase? Now, it can only be in one of three things what to do, Doug. It can be continuing to focus in the physical, right? in the physical realm, with people doing A, B, and C, because the government's doing A, B, and C, or the soldiers and Jade Helm is doing A, B, and C, so I have to respond with this A, B, and C, in the physical in but the they're physical. preparing solely from the natural or the physical, which includes our physical life. I'm sorry, Doug. Go ahead. No, no. I'm, I'm just echoing your your uh, what you're stating. I, you're right. I mean, okay, that, that's solely in the practical, physical, tangible, without regard to the spiritual. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, but that part is one third of the equation, so it's good. Uh, I want to say that people preparing. To, physically are doing good homework but we need to have the full account with god which includes the the physical and then the next the the other part now whatever a person's plan is right now listeners whatever your plan is if you're only concentrating on the physical when we really get down to it doug the motivation for the physical planning can be summed up in, in these words to preserve your physical life that's it preserve your physical land, to preserve your physical possessions or your bank account, your house. But it's all about this life that is temporary. Right. That's it. So when we look at it from that standpoint, we're kind of limiting the big picture, especially if we say we're Christians. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you have faith in God and all you're concerned about is the physical portion, what about the uh, what about when we get past that? What if you have to leave all the physical stuff and bug out? Or what if... All, all it takes, Doug, you know, someone is so proud of what they've done, they have their stuff in the basement. Hey, and when friends come over, they show them their pantry. But all it takes is one crazy neighbor lighting a Molotov cocktail and throwing it on their roof to end that plan. That's it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So from the physical, well, some people say, well, that won't happen because I'll be ready. Well, hopefully you will, but what if you're not? When we look at the fall of Yugoslavia, there are some horror stories coming, Doug, on how neighbors treated one another. Oh, absolutely. In Serbia? Yep. Hey, 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 Nathan, uh, I, I think it was Kentucky or one of the southern states. Um, power was out for, I think, a week and a half, and uh, a neighbor had a generator plugged into their house, uh, keeping their, at least their refrigerator, their food, their freezer uh, powered up. Another neighbor... Uh, plugged in to that generator, the neighbor with the generator, you know, fought. Uh, I mean, the neighbors fought, and it ultimately, if you can believe this, the neighbor without the generator sued in magistrate court the one with the generator because they wouldn't share the power, and uh, the uh, plaintiff in this case lost all of his food. Now, I, I don't know what the, um, to be honest with you, I don't know what the, uh, 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 disposition of the case was it's not important, but the fact is, think of that mentality. 
you know, and, and, and multiply that by a thousand because that's what's going to be taking place. Indeed. And when we look at the, and thank you for sharing that, that's one snapshot of, and that's when we still have the courts. What happens yeah. when the lights are out and there's no courts and we're back to frontier justice and lynching sure. and yeah. mobs and posses and all that mess. Pirates, bandits, thieves. It's going to evolve once the lights are out and once this thing gets going. In my estimation, now I know a lot of people can try to guess and I'm basing this on some of the glimpses that I've had. We have the initial event where the lights go out, whatever causes it, and then moving forward several months, whether it's six months to a year, we have the uh, official federal cavalry showing up to rescue. And then people are going to want to be rescued at that point. Of course, the purging will, will have taken place, and there won't be as many to rescue which is going to be done purposely. So between the day one of the event starting and when the cavalry shows up, the FEMA vans and, and their tents and their f- food, you have a uh, in-between interim period of, what, three months, six months, one year for the purging to take place and for the people to work out amongst themselves just how social and civilized they are, which I think is going to be a joke. But there's going to be an interim phase, and during that time, Doug, is what uh, – a lot of people are preparing for, but then in the aftermath, what do you do? But even in the interim phase, what do you do entirely to protect yourself? Because if this is an event that's divine, God's also going to be deciding who will make it and who won't. He will. It, it, it plays out the same way historically over and over. We see it playing out that way. You know, when we look at Jerusalem and history, Jerusalem got invaded several times. In the scriptures, in the Old Testament, they got invaded when Nebuchadnezzar showed up. But 11 years before the fall of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar showed up previously and took their king captive and then placed the nephew as the king. He was a puppet king, Zedekiah. And then he rebelled, and then Nebuchadnezzar showed up or showed up again and, and burned Jerusalem that time. So he showed up twice to Jerusalem. But when we move forward in time to the time of Jesus... And Jesus was here, and he died on the cross, and we know the account of when he wept over Jerusalem, and he said no stone would be left unturned. And then we saw that happen, A.D. 70, Jerusalem again fell. Well, history, according to the writings of Josephus, tells us that when Jerusalem again was surrounded in the time of the the Roman conquest, a similar thing happened that we saw happen with Jeremiah, and it was this. And by the way, before Rome surrounded Jerusalem, according to history, now get this, Doug and Joe, there were Christians, because the church had already started, and the church has existed now for a little under 40 years, and God was working in the church with Holy Spirit gifts. According to history, there were Christians receiving dreams and, and visions and warnings to leave Jerusalem. And the majority of the church had left. And a large portion of them had gone and, and lived in the uh, the outer areas, in the wilderness. But they survived the, the purge of Jerusalem, and that's why they were able to go out and spread the gospel. But God warned the church first, and they left. So what you had left was the religious types, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then some of the others that didn't listen to the warnings. And when they were surrounded by Rome, history tells us this, that the Roman government asked Josephus to go in there and to plead with them and to say, ask, tell them to surrender, and we'll treat them well. Yeah, they'll be our slaves. Some of them will be punished. Some will be flogged. But they, they will live. We won't kill them all. We're giving them a chance. So Josephus went into Jerusalem and tried to plead with them, and according to the accounts, there were 12 factions of elders amongst the, uh, the people that were holed up in Jerusalem and each elder was in charge of a different portion of the population. And Josephus tells us that when he was having his meeting with them, all they did was fight and argue amongst each other. They didn't want to listen to Josephus, and they weren't listening to each other. There was no rationale. There was no Boy, coming together of unity. <laughs> That's a lesson we can learn today, isn't it? I mean, timeless lesson. Sorry. It, it is. And But what does it tell us? It tells us that human nature is the same. Yeah. 
They don't want to listen to reason. So this is why I become concerned when I look at the different factions of the well-meaning and the alternative media who have their opinions on how this thing's going to get fixed or salvaged or turned around. And when I see that the majority of them are only looking at it through the natural, I have to shake my head and say, you guys, we're going to really, we're going to repeat history once again. And because when this thing's done, that's what's going to happen, Joe and Doug. We're going to repeat history. And the yes. majority of people who are well-meaning, who even know. Now, think about this. When we look at Jerusalem under siege in the Old Testament, they were God's children. They believed in God. They had faith. They knew the, the, the Bible or, or Moses' law. They knew better. But they were still stubborn, and they all died. When we move forward to Jerusalem again, they knew the spiritual aspect. They were religious, quote-unquote, and they still died because they were stubborn, and they were in the flesh. So when we move forward to the time of the inn, we can actually see a snapshot of that prophesied in Revelation because Revelation tells us in chapter 13 that some will go into captivity, but it also tells us that some are going to kill with the sword and be killed by the sword. So we're always going to have that certain portion of society that wants to do it themselves. And even during the days right. of Jesus, we had the spirit of Barabbas that played out in comparison to Jesus, so, and the people chose Barabbas the natural way to solve it themselves. So in the time of the end, we're going to have Ted Nugent and Charlie Daniels giving their, their cool articles and writing their cool articles and, and neat spe speeches, and the Sons of Liberty are going to read them and say, yeah, we, we can turn this around. Let's do it. And sadly, Doug and Joe, the purge will happen because God's going to be up in heaven and saying, okay, really? If you guys think you're going to solve this mess with your remedy – Let's say they did, Doug and Joe. Let's say the Patriots were able to solve everything in the natural. And then we had a lot of people die. They got rid of a lot of the, the bad senators and all that stuff. Is that going to stop the homosexual spirit over America? Is it going to stop the spirit of lawlessness and social ineptness and evil that we see? Is it going to stop all the entitled attitudes that we see and the anti-God attitudes? Will it? Oh, no. No, you're always going to have, well, I shouldn't say always. No, it's not going to stop that. But l l let me toss back a question to you, Nathan. Does that mean that um, uh, we we shouldn't, you know, uh, fight, take a position, take our position? Uh, or, or are you saying we have to... Uh, um, open up our own message, you know, the, the inner office communication that we get, and open that yellow manila envelope and, and pull out the, the, the instructions. And if it says, "Look, you, you know, um, you've got a, uh, you've got a fight," then we fight. I, I mean, or if it says to someone else, "You've got to minister here," or you've got to travel there. I, I mean, I, I guess it's. It, it, Every one of us is going to have a different set of instructions. And we well, have let's, take a, right? let's take a let's take a lesson from you know the teachers of of self defense who say right. sometimes it's better to run. No, that's fight, true. Fight yeah. another day. <laughs> yeah, but true. eventually, at some point, I do believe that there will be because Daniel tells us this: the people that do know that God will be strong and do exploits, and I believe the exploits will be supernatural miracle type exploits of ministering to one another as also being used by God for supernatural things but there will be some warriors of righteousness I do believe that Doug I fully do I have no problem okay. believing that because David was a warrior of righteousness Gideon I mean in the Old Testament that's a snapshot of, of the future and Revelation does say those there were some will with the sword kill with the sword and if someone has a problem with that well that's the Bible so there will be some some soldiers of righteousness, but the challenge that I'm trying to say is that if you're going to be a soldier, even right now with our men and women in, in service that are fighting in Iraq, it's better to have the word of God on your lips rather than the F word while you're in a firefight with ISIS, because if you die, the, the end result is going to be different. So if you're going to be a soldier in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you are, just speaking to the, those enlisted, have your hearts right with God. 
That's what I'm talking about. Be a, a well soldier said. of righteousness, and if that's what you are, then God's going to protect you. He will lead you. I have heard some accounts from Christians who were in Afghanistan, Doug. For example, I have this one account from a, a, a sergeant who was in Afghanistan, and he had just gotten – well, he, actually, he got saved after this happened, but God knew it he was going to be, become saved. And he was in a, a convoy of Humvees, and there were, he was going through a checkpoint, and he – Two Humvees went in front of him, and he stopped. And I don't know what the reason he stopped. He was fiddling or paperwork or something. And the two Humvees went on ahead, and 500 yards in front of him, they went over a, a landmine and both blew up. He wasn't with them. God preserved him. There was another time this same uh, gentleman was in a firefight, and, and it was an ambush, and God protected him. He he was in a firefight, and, and he put down some of the enemy, but God was with him. But God had an appointment with him, so what I'm saying is be a righteous soldier if you're going to be one. Don't be a soldier of the flesh with the spirit of Barabbas, because if that's the case, you will be – it'll be more tempting to be deceived, to follow the wrong counsel. And that's what I was going to talk about as as we continue in this conversation. With all the information that's out there, ladies and gentlemen, here's the reality for everybody. No one, first of all, here's the number one reality. Nobody gets to get off the right. No one gets off. There's no escape. We're all going to walk through this thing or ride through it. So that being the case, and, and most of the, the listeners know this, and they anticipate that it's coming. But the big question is what condition will you be when you go through it and what counsel will guide you? Will will you have the counsel of God or Will you have the counsel according to what sounds popular on the Internet? Now, I want to warn people with this one, Doug, again. It's, it is important to read the warning messages and the articles that you put out, your guests. You know, Steve puts news reports on his site. Right. But I want to challenge people to, with the mind of Christ, attempt to filter through it and to keep this in mind. Not all of the information may be true. Some of it partially may be true, but the people are well-meaning. So you have to, first of all, put this on the table, and you have to consider this. Is all of it true? And if it's not, then I have to keep one portion on the table that I'm not so sure about, and then the part that could be true, I need to consider it. But we need to filter through the information, first of all, Doug, because there is also disinformation out there, and I say this every time on your program, purposeful disinformation but one thing that we cannot do and that is this we cannot just stand on the surf on the beach looking out at the waves and waiting and waiting and watching the waves go further and further out wow look the fish are flopping around and the water's going out i wonder what's going on and they just stay on the, the shore waiting for the tsunami that's coming because too many people including god's people have made the wait into a camp out on the beach and they're doing nothing to prepare spiritually. Now, Jesus told us that he's coming back. The last chapter in the Bible, he says, I am coming back and my reward is with me. It's Revelation 22. And he says, my reward is with me to give to everyone according to their work. Key point, okay. ladies and gentlemen. Now, the work that Jesus talks about is our homework. Now, I'm not talking about salvation work i'm talking about the work that's the lord's business the the work is what's missing with so many people with, with so many individuals and the work is what a lot of people want to put off for a day and then a week and then a month and before you know it their, their well is empty and they're not where they're supposed to be but the work ladies and gentlemen is where we have to apply our relationship with god and the work also includes when i mention how we're going to walk through the events that are coming this means that we're supposed to be maturing in our walk with Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if some of you are baby Christians, you, you, you haven't been at this very long, it's not just about saying the sinner's prayer and then you're done. Because Jesus told us in the Gospels, he illustrates the Christian walk in the parables and in his teachings. And it's pretty sad, Doug and Joe, that the things that Jesus said are ignored by the majority of the church. And Jesus tells us, he tells us that it starts out as a seed. We know about this. And only one-fourth of the seeds take ground. The other three don't. 
So one out of four. Right. But the seeds are not just the sinner's prayer. Again, ladies and gentlemen, because the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. The, the walk with Christ is in exactly that. It is a walk to the end, following him. Salvation is about following him with your cross to the end of the destination, which is when we die. We have to continue it, continue it. So the Christian walk starts with the seed, and that seed will then sprout. And then Jesus talks about the sprout. He says that it gets watered, but then he wants to see maturity. He wants to see that it turns into a tree with branches. He wants that from every one of us, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus wants to see you having branches. And not just branches, Doug. What needs to have be on the branches? Joe, we know, we know this, right? Fruit. Fruit. <laughs> Fruit. Right. Because John the, exactly. John the Baptist told us, every branch that does not bear fruit, he will say, well, at least you did the sinner's prayer. Go ahead. You're fine. Is that what he said? <laughs> no. He said, every branch that does not have fruit is thrown into the fire and thrown away. And Jesus said this over and over. He wants to see fruit. So when we look at Revelation, he's, I am coming and my reward, my reward is with me according to the works. The work is bearing fruit. He wants to see us plant and, and water it and maintain it and nourish it and have something to show for it. The gospel today has been misinterpreted and repackaged into this version that makes it into this one-time event that means kind of it's the start, but it's been turned into the, the entire picture. Did, did you make a decision for Christ? You know, people say, ask that, and, and some guy living under a bridge who is a meth head, who is a thief, who is a rapist, said, yeah, I did it 10 years ago. Okay, you're fine. And that's not what we read in the Bible. The Bible says, to the end, ladies and gentlemen, so the homework, while we are waiting for Jade Helm, while we are waiting for the next phase, while we are waiting for what's coming, this cannot be ignored so yes the civil war is coming but the question is while we're keeping the powder dry how's the fruit my friend my patriotic friend and here's another tough word doug and this isn't from nathan this is the scriptures there are no shortcuts to this there's not and being tough is not going to excuse it and being well-meaning is not going to excuse it. And there's no cheating with Miracle Grow. Everyone has to have fruit or you get thrown out, period. So waiting for the, the tsunami and waiting for whether it's Jade Helm or the Shemitah or whatever it is, waiting for quote-unquote doom is not just accomplished by good-sounding words, keeping the, you know, the K-bar sharp, et cetera. Right. Waiting requires occupying till he comes. And to occupy means we are a disciple, not a pretender. We have to be the real thing, ladies and gentlemen. We are not right, people can see it. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> occupying does not mean just to occupy and take up space and be a doorstop. Uh, you know, we have to, um, as you say, Nathan. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very proactive, active walk in the, the word. Exactly. We, and we have to be the real thing because, you know, Doug, our uh, our kids can tell when we're flaky. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yes. How many moms get on Facebook and, you know, it's amazing. I, I get requests for friends on Facebook regularly, especially after I'm on your program. There will be a bunch. And I'll click on their wall just to see. And... I take some and some I just don't feel like taking because I don't want a witch to, you know, I just don't, or some yeah. pagan or something. But I'll look at some walls and it'll have, uh, you know, some people's version of Christianity is fake book Christianity. You know, you make a Photoshop image of a flower or butterfly and then you have a verse and people do that and they share them on Facebook. And it sounds neat. And then a lot of people say, I like it. So then they have a lot of likes. So I, I see these people placing these on their wall, and then the one right before it shows their beer party or, you know, when they're at Hooters or, you know, just silly stuff. Right. Or, you know, the, the psychic hotline or – and I'm thinking, really? 
this, this is Indeed. your Christianity to po- post something on Facebook, and then you have people agree with it. Yeah. That's not Christianity, folks. Fakery only works so long, but your family knows. And if you're a mom that puts these things, and then you have all these this nonsense in your life, your kids know it. Or if you're a father, your wife knows it, or your, your kids know it. There's no faking, and especially with God, <laughs> there's no faking, ladies and gentlemen. So we need to deal with that. Quit being a faker, first of all. <laughs> it, it looks right. bad. And, 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 you know, it, it's not just the technical or digital age, Facebook or whatever the uh, social media is. You know, you, you said something so uh, profound, you know, your your children can tell. You're living in the same house, perhaps, or you're in the same city. Uh, the interaction that you have with your children, your, your children can tell. Of all people around you, your children or your parents um, depending on on what your st- you know status is in life, your your demographic in life, you're so right, you're so correct, and and, and you know, isn't it interesting how we're talking about this, Re- really kind of in the context of current events and Jade Helm and everything, but but I mean this is uh, uh, this is profound if if you really stop and think about what what uh, Nathan is saying, this is very profound. You, you know, there's no faking it. There's, you talk about uh, transparency. I mean, it, it's all transparent, especially in the eyes, you know, in front of God. Our so, kids know. They, they know. Yeah, yeah. And then they see the fakery when you know they're they have pretender parents going to church and shaking hands and looking righteous and saying wise things, and then they go home and the kids are saying really. And so then you, you have this example from the parents, which is replayed millions of times across this country and the West or the world. So then the kids aren't sure of what's reality, what's real, what does God expect. I guess I can do the same thing, and they follow suit, and then they go through a a period of confusion as teenagers or in their young adulthood life, and then the parents finally start noticing that, whoa, my kid's a mess, I don't know why. And then they start grieving and lamenting, but they're not putting together the formula that the Part of it was because of what they showed. And, ladies and gentlemen, it's a monkey-see-monkey-do world. So if you want your kids to serve God, and and this is why I say this, Doug, because, see, Jesus brought us the ministry of reconciliation, meaning we can fix it, but it takes us, first of all, to look in the mirror and admit that we made a mess of things, which means, and, and I start with the parents every time, whether you're a father, mother, single, or, or married, I start with the parents, because if we did make some regretful decisions and we were bad examples, and but now we're coming along, step one is not just going for it full bore and then just start shoving down your kids the warning message. Step one, ladies and gentlemen, is to have a meeting and go one by one to your kids and admit that you made a mess of things, and now you're trying to, to turn a new leaf. You've repented, and you want to, to bring the family into the, the fold of God. But you have to admit that you were not the, the best example. That will go a lot further than trying to just shove the warning message to your kids. Because people email me, Doug, and they complain of this, and and I ask them, well, have you, you know, had a talk with them? And that's step one. So, and, and that's and a, that's a very good, you know, what Nathan, that is so right on. Um, you know, so many people are. Uh, well intentioned as they're attempting to act as as watchmen well intentioned and in, in d- doing what they're called to do i suppose but you know without that um talk shall we say without that hey wait a minute you know look this is just, here, here sit down we have to have a conversation um a, a lot of the warnings a lot of the this is what you know i, I I know or I believe is is about to take place this is why without without the preface to that man you know it, it it's a lot of times ineffectual and you're looked as a disingenuous loon at best so I think that's I think you're right on the money very profound with what you're saying there are so many people today Doug that are hurt and broken well let's look at the grown-ups that might be pretending right now but if they have some hurt from what their parents did to them, but now they're middle-aged, there is no greater gift, and I say this over and over, there is no greater gift than a parent 
apologizing for the mess they did to their kids because every child wants to hear it. And it would work milestones of healing to get the thing started. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have kids that are struggling, they're on drugs, they're away from God, they deny God, they're not, whatever, if you would just try this, be humble and repent to them, you would be a... It would be amazing, the the healing that could take place. That's where it has to start. Amen. Very, I see the very time. Safe, but Yeah, it, it really flies when you're on, Nathan. It really does. And you keep better track of it than we do, <laughs> yeah, which we appreciate. So we'll take our top of the hour break right now. Folks, you're listening to Nathan Leal. His website, watchmanscry.com. That's watchmanscry.com. We're talking about the state of the spiritual state of the church in the country and the globe tonight as well as Jade Helm the latest decision by the Supreme Court and much more putting things in perspective we'll be right back stay with us .com. Uh, go there for the uh, articles the research the audio sermons oh the forums. sermons man Joe yeah. His, uh, for such time as this um, and, and I I Failed to mention it too when I was talking to him off air today. Uh, what I got out of those sermons, the audio page, uh, the audios, they're just click on the man, Yeah, there's so many, uh, and they're on, they are on some uh, very in inspired messages. And, and folks on, on Watchman's Cry uh, dot com, scroll down and, and please look at the documentation Nathan has amassed uh, regarding Jade Helm versus America. Okay, Jade Helm versus Christians, and and go, and go ahead and click on the links to, to the uh, uh, the exposés, part one, part two, the prophetic dream, a nuclear event in Montana, and, and it's amazing. And I'm not. This is not false flattery or flattery at all. It's just a matter of fact. Um, we a lot of the information that we talked about back in January, in February, March. This is really coming to pass. I, I mean, a lot of the information here, it's, I'm not surprised by it. I, I guess I'm just reinforcing the fact that there's a lot of value to the archived posts. So uh, with that, uh, let's bring them back on. Nathan, Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, no Thank problem. you, gentlemen. Uh, Doug and Joe, I'm, I'm looking at a, an email I got during the break, or might have been okay. before. I haven't had a chance to to verify or read, but it's interesting in, uh, from the person that just sent it, and you know you know who you are. Um, it says, one more thing. Uh, the siege you speak of on Hagman happened on Tammuz 9, and right now in Israel it's Tammuz 9. And it took three weeks from the point of the breach to take over the city. So today the Supreme Court decision for homosexual marriage, right now it's Tammuz 9 in Jerusalem, that's the anniversary of the wall breach, but three weeks after, he says that's how long they took, is July 17th. That's a few days after the start of Jade Helm 15. One last point, the golden calf happened on Tammuz 17. I wouldn't be surprised to see a modern parallel coming in celebration of this decision. So that's something to, uh, that's interesting to, to watch, I guess, in three weeks from now. What's going to happen? I don't know, but that I find that interesting. Guess. So yeah, thank you for yeah. sending that. Listener. Wow. Anyway, moving forward, gentlemen, um, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5, it says, Evil men do not understand judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. So what that's telling us is that when people who are thinking in the natural continue to stay in the natural, they're not going to really bring the equation or the, the variable of God, the divine, as a part of the events that they're witnessing, as being a part of judgment. Instead, they will want to verbalize it in a way that says, well, it was the weather or it was a coincidence. Or Natural man doesn't want to acknowledge God. And that's a tendency that I, I notice, even with the drought that's happening in California, gentlemen, in the big picture, that's God's judgment. God is yes. allowing that drought to happen. And when God judges a land, he, for the most part, uses human agency. So 
he could be using harp and, and evil men that are playing with the levers of space uh, weather control, etc. Et but that doesn't mean that it starts and finish, finishes with them and their motives. It means that God's allowing it to happen. So we, when we're looking at events happening worldwide, need to include that God is the sovereign Lord of this planet. He's the King of Kings, and he's allowing things to happen. So as Fukushima is polluting the Pacific Ocean, it wasn't just because they weren't being careful. It's because God's allowing it to happen. So if we are those who seek God, then we'll understand this, and we will not sidestep the reality of his judgment. That also means another thing. That means that we will fear him more, and we have to acknowledge that if he's allowing these things to happen, that he's going to be in control of the future events as they manifest, which means that we have someone to tap into for protection or provision or help or peace to help us go through it. And that's what I'm trying to say. Without God in, in the uh, formula of our planning, we're not going to make it, ladies and gentlemen. So please, I, I want to just continue to uh, hammer that home. Now, it's easy to just throw out, okay, folks, get right with God, get your house in order, and, and leave it at that. And that would sound poetic, I guess, Doug. That would sound like a good challenge. Folks, get right with God. But a lot of people don't know how to do it. They, they really don't. They don't know what it takes to overcome some of the vices that they have and some of the disciplines. They don't understand because they haven't been taught or they're not in church or maybe the church doesn't even show them or offer them spiritual food. So that's why I want to point people to some of the messages that I have because I break it down and talk uh, about it. And the number one theme that conti that needs to continually happen for those who are trying to get their house in order is that we have to literally get the inside of us, our house, in order, meaning we have to deal with some matters that in the past we ignored, swept under the rug, kept in the closet, or didn't want to talk about. We have to deal with those things. And there's one thing, now, right before the break, I brought up having a talk with your kids, mm -hmm. Doug, which is good advice. Ladies and gentlemen, you can figure out the time. If you don't know how to do it or you're afraid because you don't know how it's going to turn out, then pray and ask God to give you the right words and to soften them if they're real bitter. Ask him to help. But at least that's a, a plan that's, that's better than doing nothing. So if you're worried about your kids that are away from God, tell them that you're sorry you had the affair. You, you, you know, you, you broke up the marriage. You were hurtful to their mother or their father. You did things that weren't right. Say it to them. They want to hear it. Doug, I'll say this over and over. The number one thing a, a child of divorce wants to hear from their parents is they're sorry that it happened. And that's take some true. of the blame. Because most that's kids true. think it's their fault. It, but, unfortunately, that's equally true. Yeah. So, folks, I want to challenge you with this. I know it's, it won't be easy. I know there will be a lot of tears, and, and that's good. Let them see you have tears. But, but if you are concerned over the well-being of your whole household, then this is where reality sets in. Let's deal with the real stuff. Because how many people go to their grave and they, even at dad's funeral, say, he never told me. He was sorry. He never mm -hmm. did. And it's a sad narrative. So that's one challenge I have. Now, I'm going to throw out something that may be hard to hear, but it may also be the missing piece, perhaps, with some people in their walk with God. And it is this. So, ladies and gentlemen, please hear me out. It comes from the Old Testament, but when we look at... When we look at the the uh, challenge in Second Chronicles, if my people will humble themselves, you know, call upon God and, and humble and God will heal their land. You know that verse; it's real famous. Mm -hmm. Let's just do that, and and God will heal our land, and, and the nation will repent, and judgment will stop. People use that verse, but it doesn't go into detail on what the humbling is. What I'm mentioning right now is the humbling, and that's the part that's the hardest because humbleness kills pride which is what is causing most people to fail in their Christian walk. It's the pride of the flesh that doesn't want to die. It wants to be in control. The best way to kill pride is humbleness. There's nothing else that would do it, and honesty and reality and shining a light on the situation. So when we look at the humbleness that God wants from us, and by the way, that's also the missing piece of so many people in their walk with God when they do the, the salvation, quote-unquote, event. 
You know, I, I get so frustrated. I don't want to digress, but I've talked about this often on, on my programs, Doug. Today's modern me- method of getting saved is at the end of some dead sermon, dry sermon, there's no presence of God, the preacher will end. Everybody, okay, we're at the end of the sermon. Look at our watch. The rose is burning. It's time to go. Oh, by the way, everyone close your eyes. No looking around. Who wants to get saved? Oh, I see that hand. Okay, everyone keep your eyes closed, and he'll say, recite the sinner's prayer. Okay, everyone open your eyes, and then they go home, which I think is one of the most pathetic Pathetic representations of the gospel, Doug and Joe. I mean, don't get me started on sure. that because there's no humbleness that takes place. There's no repentance. There's no actual realization of how bad sin is and and what Jesus went through on the cross with and why he shed his blood. There's a, a monotone, robotic re- reciting of a, a sinner's prayer, and then people are made to believe that they got saved when they didn't even deal with anything. They didn't deal with the mess they've made of their lives. And when we look at people actually coming to Jesus in, in the Gospels, there's a lot of drama. It's, there, it's powerful. There's voices crying out. There's people begging. There's people pleading. It, it's very dramatic and emotional. There's a lot of tears. But today in churches, we have taken what Jesus did when he died on the cross into some distilled, sanitized event where now I have even heard this. You shouldn't have emotion in church. Which, How does that I don't know. Work? It's pathetic because Jesus died on the cross was emotional, and it was powerful, and it was impactful, and it was one of the most profound events ever to happen in the history of mankind and the universe. How can you deal with that on a distilled, sanitized, unemotional, intellectual Mm -hmm. level? You can't. So what I'm trying to say about the humbling process, we need to deal with stuff. And when we look at the book of Leviticus in the... In chapter 26, I've talked about this before on your program. God says, it's, it's the uh, choosing the blessing and the curse speech from Moses when God says, if you follow, you'll be blessed, but if you don't, you'll be cursed. You'll, you'll, you'll experience some spankings, and God progressively says, it'll get seven times worse each time if you don't humble yourself. God says in Leviticus 26, 16, I've shared this before, but I'll just say it again. If you don't humble yourself, I will appoint terror over you, wasting disease, fever, and it goes into I will let those who hate you reign over you. I've talked about that several times, Doug. You remember the seven times uh, judgment? And it gets seven times worse. And then verse 21, it says it again. If you walk contrary, I will send seven times more plagues. And then a few verses later in verse 24, I'll, I'll I'll punish you seven times for your sins. Now, God is telling them what will happen if they disobey, which is what America is doing right now. America is not following, so we're going to get the judgment of sevens. It's going to happen. But there's something interesting stated at the end of this chapter, and I want to just throw this out to the listeners, because maybe this is something that people could try if they're really struggling in their walk with bitterness, with hurt, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, please make note of this. Make it your homework. Pray about it. Take it to God, and then... Deal with it if you can. But at the end of Leviticus 26, it says that, well, let me back up to verse 39. Leviticus 26, 39. And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemy lands, also in their father's iniquities, which are with them, they shall waste away. Verse 40 says something interesting, Doug. It says, but if they confess their iniquity, okay, this is the humbling part that I'm talking about, But then look what it says in addition. And the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful, that they have walked contrary, that I have walked contrary to them. And if their hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember them. So in addition to confessing our own mess, Doug and Joe, watch this. One of the biggest obstacles to having victory in the Christian walk is bitterness, unforgiveness. Because God tells us if we can't forgive, he, we won't, he won't forgive us, but we already know that. It's hard when you're dealing with, with bitterness and unforgiveness. And how many people deal with sore spots in their history with their parents, their father, or maybe their mother, and they, they can't get over it. And because they can't get over it, now they can't see behind the scenes of what it does to their spirit 
spiritual walk on how it may be an open door to not having victory. But they just know they can't deal with it. But let me throw this out, ladies and gentlemen. What if, what if, as this verse says, confess the sins of your father? Now, does that mean you just say, God, forgive Dad. He didn't know better. Is that all it means? I don't think so. Doug, I, I propose this. I think it means to actually stand in the gap for your parents and you pray in tears and you get to the point where you go beyond the bitterness and now you you are associated with, wow, my, my parents, my dad was a man of flesh. He was a guy like me and I know what I struggle with and, wow, I guess he struggled with the same thing, and it wasn't easy for him. For whatever reason, he failed. I've been mad at him about it. God, can you forgive him? And when someone starts to really think about it from that standpoint, Doug, it it moves from bitterness to actually thinking about what they did and then realizing that, hey, I guess I'm not the only innocent one in this thing. And you start having a softness of forgiveness. When you pray for someone else and you ask God to, to help them, it helps you not to have bitterness when you stand in the gap. That's what I'm trying sure to say. Sure, yeah. So I'm, I'm throwing that out, ladies and gentlemen. Just try it. Think about it because it's here in the Bible. Now, I don't know the background, what it does to our soul doing this, you know, the formula and all that. It just makes sense. It's simple. So try it. I just want to have that as part of the homework because as the people who are listening to this message are hearing that, hey, the time's running out, and we've got to make sure that we are operating in the right frame of thought, spiritually understanding judgment. We also have to deal with the matters of the heart. So, ladies and gentlemen, please keep that in mind. Now, I want to shift gears, Doug, and I want to talk about some things. If we understand that we're in a, a time, a, a sovereign period of judgment, even though it looks in the natural to, to just be chaos and a mess and, and we can point fingers – at the bad people, overall, it's God allowing it to happen. And with that, there's a lot of people wondering what to do. Now, if someone wasn't in the spiritual realm in their thinking and they were just reading the regular reports that come out, a lot of reports and articles from well-meaning colleagues and people in the alternative media are noticing that the United States is a mess and so people are writing articles about things like that. So let's address this for a moment. A lot of people are wondering, including the listeners, Doug, what do I do? Okay, I know we're in trouble, Nathan, especially with what just happened today. What do I do? Do I well, leave the country? I, you know, or what, yeah, what exactly. do I Exactly. Right. Go ahead. What do I do? What can I do? That's a question people are wondering about. And if they read an article that says leave the country and it's just – blatant, it's bold, there's there's no variables, there's no explanation, it just says get out of Dodge, leave. Some people read that and they might find themselves panicked and, and thinking, whoa, I've got to leave the country, what do I do? So some people start thinking that way and they go, in the natural, Doug, they don't pray, pray about it, they say, what do we do? Well, let's sell the house and whatever equity we can get out, which is not much, let's just do it and let's go. Let's drain the 401k and go. And they do it, and Doug, over the last few years, and Joe, you might have done this too, I have examined many of the forums of expats, people who, who move to South America or the West, wherever they move, and there's a lot of blogs out there of people that moved. And I've noticed uh, a trend with some people who did it spontaneously, and then you run across some blogs. If you really do your homework of people say, I'm headed back. I tried it uh -huh. out for a year. It didn't work out. I, I hated it. I'm going home. But some of them also have to admit that I'm going to go home to I don't know what because I drained my 401, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I quit my job. And, wow, what do I do? And these are just regular folks talking about it. So I want to throw this out, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot support, even though, I can't say that judgment's going to happen to America with this gay marriage thing. I understand that. But I also have to include this. Do not leave the country without God's leading, without the will of God. Do not do it. Because if you leave the country or you make it your plan to do it spontaneously, you may regret it. And it could be very, very expensive. 
So, Nathan, how could you say that? I, I'm saying it because I'm watching people do it, and then it doesn't work out. And the other thing to realize, Doug, is that, okay, I know there's an argument, and there could be several shows on this. There could be books, sermons, arguments that people say, Nathan, the Bible tells us to leave Babylon. You, you, what are you, what no, are you doing? No, we're commanded to leave Babylon. We're commanded to leave Babylon. I, I don't want to mock that, I, and it's not my intent to mock, but a, a, a lot of um, people will come, and I receive emails saying, hey, uh, you say, Doug, you know, you're, you, you've got no plans to leave. Well, I, I don't have any unction to leave based on my prayer, you know, my, my prayers and, and basically what I feel I'm being led by. By, by the Holy Spirit, and, okay. and, and Babylon encompasses more than than one country's landmass. It is a exactly it's political there you go. Yep. system. Um, take uh, the monetary system for example, and look at paper money. Say that was the system of Mystery Babylon. Uh, it's been adopted by the whole world. It's a system that will crumble. We have a physical and a spiritual to, to all things on earth. And, and yeah, exactly. Babylon, the Babylonian financial system will be uh, operable in uh, Costa Rica, as, as it is in America, as it is in Nicaragua, perhaps, or or um, you know, uh, Panama. You know, so uh, yeah, and it's important for people to understand this. Go ahead. As I stated, Doug, this could be <laughs> it's a can of worms. And we could do several shows on it. It could be a big debate. But let's look at what the Bible says, in fairness, because really that's all that matters. When we look at the references in Scripture telling us to leave Babylon, we find it in Jeremiah 50, 51, and then we see some snapshots in Revelation. But when we look at why we should leave Babylon, it says so you don't take a part of her, in, in her sins, and God's judgment is going to destroy Babylon. It also includes, now ladies and gentlemen, please hear me out. Because let me throw it, let me put it this way: What if? Okay. First of all, Revelation tells us Babylon sits on all the kings of the earth, on all the mountains of the earth, all the the hills, all seven hills. It occupies the whole world, just like you said, Doug. And we know this: the IMF, the dollar, sits on the whole world. It controls most of the world, or it tries to at least. So that part we can't ignore. The Bible tells us in Revelation she sits on the entire planet, not just within the borders. So the IMF, the World Bank, which is part of this Babylon system, exceeds the borders of America, which goes in, um, that goes into several shows. We could talk, talk about capital controls and how America has bamboozled banks all around the West to now grab and steal any expats trying to leave, 30% off the top, and send it to the IRS. So how can America do that when they're in another country? Well, that's because the Babylonian system has spread its tentacles everywhere, which includes the EU. By the way, the EU building looks like Babylon. We've seen that, right, the capital? Yeah. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, here's another thing. We need to leave Babylon before she's destroyed. Well, the destruction of America is going to happen in several phases. The the attack that's coming is going to happen not in just one event. There's going to be, I believe, several events that take place. The first one will be to bring chaos and to strike a wound on the world that will bring about the, the New World Order. It's going to provide the shift to the end-time narrative of what we see in Scripture. But then we read about the destruction of Babylon in Revelation, and if we were to be honest... Using this biblical integrity, let's not pretend and let's not use biblical gymnastics. Let's use proper scholarship when we say this. When we look at when Babylon gets destroyed, ladies and gentlemen, it happens in Revelation chapter 19, right before Jesus returns. I'm turning right here in my Bible, uh, Revelation. Okay, Excellent. I have it right here, Revelation 19. After these things I heard a loud voice, a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged her and her blood on the servants shed by her. Again, they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. So Babylon just got destroyed on, on 
Revelation 19, and then a few verses later, I heard, as it were, a, a voice of a great multitude, sound of many waters. The Lord omnipotent reigns. Jesus gets on his horse. The marriage of the Lamb has come, and he returns to earth. So the destruction of Babylon happens right before the return of Jesus. It doesn't happen seven years before or ten years or fifteen. It happens at the very end of the narrative. So if someone believes that Jesus is about to return next month or this summer, physically, then I guess they would expect Babylon to get about to get destroyed. But let's, uh, let's respect what the Bible says here, and let's look at it for what it says. So I'm throwing that out. Excuse me. I'm throwing that out, Doug, because I believe that we need to be honest about the situation. We cannot just react to a scary article. Some people are saying, leave the country now. But in fairness, let me throw this out. All right? Now, I don't want to rain on the parades of some people, but let me just throw this out, and I'm being honest, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, what, you weren't being honest before, Nathan? Okay, some people don't like that word. I'm, I'm being <laughs> frank, okay, and candid. Okay. Better go. way to word it. When we look at the destination of some countries, to leave America, to leave the oppression and the tyranny and the lack of rights and freedoms, and people say, I'm going to go to this country, I have looked, Doug, and I've looked at many countries around the world, and there are pros of moving to some countries, and there are cons. Let's use Panama as an example. I know Panama is beautiful. I know some people are choosing to live in a mountain region of, of Panama. Boquete is one of them. It's becoming popular. But when we look at the big picture, Panama just, just passed uh, uh, an amendment, and they, a Mexican country, uh, I'm sorry, a Mexican business, company was given awarded the contract panama just passed a uh, uh, a rule that all their cars are going to have rfid tags on them so anytime they go through any sensor around panama they're followed and tracked that's in panama we don't even have that here right now also the irs has built some satellite offices in panama panama to make sure that all the expats are, are paying their fair share so now there's double taxation going on unless they dump their citizenship. But if people do that, then they don't get their retirement Social Security, which a lot of people depend on. I'm being – Doug, this is the, the reality of the picture. Sure. Not everything is perfectly rosy. Here's the other thing. If, and I've noticed this in all South American, for the most part, countries that when I've examined the lifestyle there, and this is what people can expect. If you use public transportation or walk in, in the sidewalk or when you do, run, do your errands around the city, they're going to steal your wallet. The pickpockets, the thieves who are very talented with that, have a thriving industry of pickpocketing. And I read some of the testimonies of expats, and they said that's just the way it is. You, you'll, you'll get robbed. Another thing is, for the most part, most of the uh, houses have burglar bars because petty crime is very rampant. Or if some people say, well, I don't want to have burglar bars, so they live out in the country, well, the, it, there's an expectation, and it even says this. When I was reading about Panama, they said if you live in the country, expect to be robbed when you're gone or burglarized. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm painting the, the picture of reality here. Not everything is the most rosy you just anywhere you go. The Flatbush, uh, the Flatbush area, Brooklyn, uh, in the uh, in, in New York City. I mean, it, it's you know you're not going to run from this. Yeah, I, I mean it's the the more. It, it, the, well, what is it? The grass is greener, always greener on the other side. Well, no, it's not. I mean, it, the reality is, as you say, you know, every location has its own set of issues, and a lot of them are very similar to what's going on in America today. And, and, and I think, you know what, Nathan, since you brought this up, I think it's it's extremely important because a lot of people are fe are feeling pinched and and uh, you know painted into a corner, saying, "Oh my goodness, I've got to, I've got to go." I, I got to go, don't I? And that really causes a lot of unnecessary stress when you're not grounded in the word. Okay, that's just my thought. But oh my. thank you, Doug. Exactly, and that will cause more stress. So that's why I want to challenge people. While you're making your plans and formulating your plan, we need to include God and His will and His peace and His provision, His guidance. The Lord is my shepherd; He leads me. So. We have to have them lead us. Now, some people are called to, to leave the country. I'll, I'll say sure. that. Some people are. But it's not blanket. It, it's not one 
one thing for everybody. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention, in case some people are thinking about it, there are two economies in Latin America, two. Middle, Central America, and South America, there are two economies. There's the, the Latin America citizen economy, and then there's the gringo economy. Anyone from America has the, a different set of prices and fees and costs. If you want to hire a contractor, someone fix your car, there's the gringo rate because Americans are rich. So that's what you have to deal with. There's nothing set in stone, and that could be annoying. The other thing to keep in mind, Doug, because when the dollar crashes, ladies and gentlemen, consider this. When the dollar crashes, it's going to crash down there too. And the people that are getting their stipend, their check, will it still be there? And then the other thing, how angry are the the South Americans going to be at any American that they see because it's gringo's fault? Sure. We're, we're going to be the pariah of the world. And you better let me check to see. Hang on a second here. Are you allowed to? Are we allowed to say "gringo" on the air? Is that a? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they see on their blogs. <laughs> I'm just, no, I, I'm I'm actually trying to lighten the mood here. But no, I, you're you're exactly right. I mean, it, as an American, uh, anywhere outside of the United States, you're going to be looked on as as a pariah, especially when uh, the dollar collapses. And this is being orchestrated that way, uh, Nathan. I mean, it's orchestrated so America America will be the pariah among nations, and Americans by default. Now, the other thing that I have to share, Doug, and this may not strike people as happy news, but again, it's the Scripture, because here's... He who understands God, who seeks God, knows judgment. The Bible tells us judgment will begin in the house of God, Period. If God is going to judge his church, that means if you're his child, you're going to go through it it's in some form or another. God's going to want to knock off the rough edges that we need knocked off and, and prune us so that we grow fruit if we haven't been doing it, meaning we have to go through our – we need to bear our cross. We need to go through our events of pain, of tears, of grief, of purging, of being poured out. That is so required we because so cause we he loves us. Yeah, yeah. We're I mean, refining, really, exactly. That's right. Okay. So is it possible for someone to pack up and escape the refining process and just go live in comfort? <laughs> Where do I sign up? No, no. There are no shortcuts to this. You, you know, I guess, is that what you're trying to say? That there really is no shortcuts. Well, if someone, have a pro- if someone has a problem with what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, if you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, no, don't get mad at me. Jesus says the lukewarm church needs to be chastised because who the Lord loves, he chastens. So if we're going to be chastened, we cannot be chastened in comfort. They don't go together. You can't have a testimony without pain. You can't have a testimony without working through some things. So when we look at the big picture and what America deserves to go through, we all contributed to it. I've already gone through some seasons of pain, and you know that. You know my testimony with my health. I've been crippled for two years, a few years back when I busted out my knee and I, I, I had financial ruin for several years. I ended up broke and poor, dumpster diving. I've shared that testimony. That was seven, eight years ago. But going through that, Doug, worked, it, it worked some great things in me. It, God knocked off some of the things that I needed not to have knocked off, and I saw myself in new ways that I didn't if I wouldn't have gone through that. Same thing with my wife, same thing with my kids. There is no way to understand what pain is or what other people are going through without going through it yourself. You know, it was interesting, uh, side note, when I was crippled for two years, uh, when I busted my ACL, we didn't have the insurance, so I'm still missing that ligament. I never had the surgery. But for two years I limped, and then I graduated to a cane. Doug, I had never, ever before that taken to account when I saw an old person walking slow at the store in front of me. I'd never taken into account that they were a human and with thoughts and fears and a life and kids and uh, their own story. Because most of the time when you see an elderly person walking slow, you walk past them and say, get out of my way, old man, or whatever. Or you might not exactly. say it, but it's You're dismissed. Thinking. Yep. Well, after I was crippled and when I would you know, be at Wally World or Target or wherever I was, and I was limping and I saw an old person, I actually stopped and right next to him, and I said, uh, my cane's prettier than yours, or, wow, your cane looks better than mine. And, and we actually talked 
uh, about ar- arcanes. And I had never had the attachment to understand what it felt like to be injured. Or I, I started noticing, you know, the people driving around the golf cart because they have a busted leg. Most, time, most of the time you don't talk to them. But when I was injured and in driving the golf cart, it was like, you know, I'll race you when you see someone else. Or There's a process of, of a new part of life when you go through things that you never have before, and that's good for us. It's good to see things through a, a different perspective because then we get outside the, the realm of it's all about us. We, we start realizing that, wow, every person has a story. It's not easy. So... The only way for us to go through something like this is for God to lovingly prune us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please keep that in mind. Now, the thing to to make sure of is that while you're being pruned, because we're all going to be pruned, to make sure that we understand why it's happening and that it needs to happen, and it's because God loves us and it's going to make us better. Now, while it's going on at the time, there's a lot of tears and confusion, but if we keep ourselves submitted to God, then we'll know that it's for the best. And and we're going to come out on the other end refined, as you said, Doug. I I, I love that word, refined, and you're exactly right. But when we look at, see the time, man, this is going flying by. When we look at the book of Jeremiah, I was mentioning how the the remnant got smaller and smaller. And that's found from Jeremiah 39 through 44. And ladies and gentlemen, when you have a chance, just read it. It's interesting, Doug. Because I fully believe we're going to follow the same, the same narrative, and we're going to rhyme with it. After Babylon left, Nebuchadnezzar left his puppet governor, and some of the people who were hiding in the woods, in the mountains, were the patriots, the survivalists. They came out of the, the from hiding after Nebuchadnezzar left. He left a small little occupying force, and and a puppet governor. Well, the puppet governor's name was Jedediah. And one of the Patriot guys, his name is Johannan. Johannan found out that another one of the survivalists, named Ishmael, was bribed by the neighboring country, the Ammonites, and Ishmael was told to go and kill that governor and to take all the remaining refugees as prisoners to to the Ammonite, the neighboring kingdom. So Johannan found out about it, and he told the governor, hey, Ishmael wants to kill you. And Jedediah didn't believe it, but within a few days, Ishmael killed the governor and then took the, the people that survived as prisoner. So Johannan, Johansson had to go rescue, or Johannan had to go rescue the remnant who were being taken off by Ishmael. Now, when we pull back and just look at that narrative, well, if we were to compare it with what America is going to go through, we have the Babylonian invasion. And then the occupation, this is in the future when it, when it happens. Ishmael represents the Muslim invasion of killing people. And we're going to see the Muslims come into America because we find it in Jeremiah. His name is Ishmael. What a coincidence. So Ishmael is going to wreak havoc. The Muslims are going to wreak havoc. And then the patriots are going to fight the Muslims, which is on paper good, right? So Johanan went and rescued the remnant. And he saved the day, and Ishmael, the Muslims, they, they, they fled. So then Johanan has these people, and he's a captain. He has a few military guys with him. And they go to Jeremiah, and they say, Jeremiah, Ishmael just killed the governor. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back here mad, and he's going to whack all of us. What do we do? Tell us what to do. Jeremiah went to God. Ten days later, he had a message. God said to stay here, and it's going to be okay. Nebuchadnezzar is not going to hurt you because God has decided that the judgment's finished. He's going to, the hurricane's done. The growth is coming back. I'm going to rebuild. It's going to be okay. So just trust me. Well, the Patriot guy, Johanan, said, uh, you know what? I don't believe you. I'm going to go to Egypt, and we're going to take the remnant. We're leaving the country. We'll be safe over there. And Jeremiah made it clear. No, God wants you to stay here as the remnant and learn faith to depend on him. If you go to Egypt, you think you're going to escape and you're not going to be purged or learn faith. That's not how it gets to happen. You need to stay. Well, they didn't listen to him, Doug. So most of those people went off to Egypt, and God gave a word to Jeremiah and told him, I want you to let the people know that because they didn't want to trust me and listen to me, and they fled under their own will, my Judgment that has stopped now in, in Jerusalem 
is going to follow them to Egypt and kill all of them, everyone. And the only ones that are going to make it are the ones that escape and change their mind and come back and submit to me. So there's something interesting, the way it's summed up, and this is found in Jeremiah 43, and I want to read it. It says, when Nebuchadnezzar follows you to Egypt, when he comes, he shall strike the land of Egypt and deliver to death those appointed for death, and to captivity those appointed for captivity, and to the sword those appointed for the sword. I will kindle a fire in the houses of Egypt. He shall burn it, but you're not going to escape. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's very important to understand this. Every one of us have a different appointment. There's not a blanket will of God for everybody. So please do not let your motivation and guidance be a, be a scary YouTube that you read or an article. God has the ability to protect people in the middle of Egypt while the angel of death walks right by. He can protect Amen your family. That. Yes. Because he's done it, right, Doug? Joe? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to challenge everybody. If Psalms 91 occurs during judgment and there's a destroyer that's walking up and down at, at noontime, at midnight, killing people, but those that trust in God are protected. So another interesting point. When Jesus told Jerusalem, 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 how often I wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her, her chicks under her wing, but you wouldn't have it. Remember when Jesus said that? He wept over Jerusalem. Right. He said, I wanted to have you under my wing and protect you, but you did not want me. He denied me. And then there was another time he wept over Jerusalem, and he said, you didn't see the hour of your visitation. So, And Jesus wept. But what he meant by this, he was prophesying the fall of Jerusalem that came in 70 A.D. And when you think about it, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. When Jesus said, I wanted to put you under my wing as a mother hen with her babies, when we look at Psalms 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High under the shelter of his wing. So Jesus was showing that he is able. He's God. He's Messiah. He's the King of Kings, the Ancient of Days. He can put us under his wing if we let him. So what he was saying was when Jerusalem gets invaded, even though it happens, Psalms 91 will come into play for you and your family because I'll have you under my wing. But you wouldn't have it. That's what he was telling them. So that's a promise that we all have, Doug and, and Joe and ladies and gentlemen. So, folks, as you are looking at what to do, do not do things spontaneously. Whenever you're thinking of what to do, you have to take it to God and say, God, am I doing this right? You have to ask him, God, is this your will? You also have to include this, God, is this information true? What do I do? Where do I go? What should I say? And then you have to wait for the, for the answer. You how many times? Wait. Right. How many times have we said, or have you heard, you've got to take it to the Lord. You've got to take it to prayer. You've got, if you hear something or whatever it is, you've got to use discernment by taking it, not by intellectually dissecting it, but by taking it to the ultimate authority. Amen. And I want to give this as a comfort to some of the elderly who are shut in, Doug. And how many of your listeners are? That they can't Many. afford to move. Of course. So they, so so the what's the plan? Plan B. What's plan B? That's plan Psalms ninety one. So take comfort in that, ladies and gentlemen. Or maybe God will situate you to maybe move a little further out if you're in the inner city and you need to leave a little further. But that's going to be God showing the people what to do. Doug, I have seen people over the last few years who spontaneously yanked up their possessions and loaded up the U-Haul, they sold everything, and then they moved, relocated, and then it turned out that they were out of the will of God, and then they moved back. Or, how about this one, Doug, and, and it's embarrassing to say, but it's true. Ladies and gentlemen, if you yank up and, and move spontaneously out of the will of God, I've seen this too many times. People run out of money, and then they become someone else's problem. Or they have to depend on people who have prepared they become a burden. Yeah. They make themselves they made themselves an emergency and then they have to then because of guilt, well you can't just leave people to starve. They're making themselves be someone's burden when it didn't have to be that way. And I can't say this enough, Doug. I've I've encountered this too many times. I've seen people also, here's the other thing. You can't just yank up 
if it's against God's will or if it breaks the, the biblical model. Meaning, I've seen husbands leave their wives because they're not awake, so they just abandon them and leave, or a wife leave a husband, take the kids, and they leave the state because they want to get ready. They're afraid. I've got to go to Montana. I've got to go to wherever, the, the wilderness, the west, to get ready for doom. And they leave their, their loved one or their spouse who has not been abusing them, who is done, doing what he's supposed to do. He's a provider, but he's not awake. And that's the other thing, Doug. And, Joe, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot leave and abandon the biblical model spontaneously because to do that means you're out of God's will. You can't leave the will of God to try to find the will of God. I, I like the way you said that. That's that's so true. Yeah, Exactly. So, anyway, uh, Doug, I, I know I said a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a lot of stuff. But that's where, if we're Christians, we have to include him in our planning. I hope that I communicated the, the situation about being an expat. Some people are called to do it, Doug. I want to make that clear. Some people oh, are, sure. but not everyone is. Sure, exactly, and you know, I, I, Nathan, I think you, I think you made it really clear, and we've said it so many times. You know, uh, we have to read our own mail. We have to read the instructions we are given. It's not going to be the same as your neighbor, your friend, and someone else. You know, your coworker. Um, the, the messages are uh, very specific to us. We have to use discernment, in my view, anyway. And, and you know that should and I and I hope what Nathan said and I, Nathan I, I I believe what you said really spoke to and, and should be speaking to the people out there who have no one and there's so many people out there who I hear from and we hear from and it's like I'm alone I, I, I'm elderly I'm infirmed what what about me you know what about me I'm afraid because what's going to happen to me. And Nathan, I think that you you really painted the picture to answer those fears, those questions, those concerns. Because you know you're not alone. You're not alone at all. Don't be afraid. Indeed, folks. Yeah, listen to the still small voice because he's there. Amen. He's there. It's been it's been a really rough week, Nathan. It's been a rough day. It's been it's been a, a very emotional time for our country for many people personally. And, and I think that the uh, information, the inspiration, the intellectual guidance, the spiritual guidance that you provided, the combination of both has really been a shot in the arm that we needed. Well, praise God. I just hope people will take it to heart, Doug. And thanks for having me on, as usual. You guys are a blessing. Oh, no, you, you're the blessing for us. And, thanks for the... You know, you and your wife are just so terrific. Yeah, thanks for the tremendous spiritual insight and uh, all the words of wisdom that you shared with us today. It was a fantastic, fast-paced show. And, and let me just say this, you know, not every event, not everything that we're going through are zeros and ones. <laughs> exactly. You know, they're, it, it's a spiritual journey, and, and you painted that well. Wow. Thank you. Nathan. Praise God. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. God bless. Good night. Mm -hmm. Folks, that'll do it for us tonight. Um, we have a, a packed week next week. Uh, Steve Quayle and Pastor Langford on Wednesday. Monday open. Uh, Stan on Tuesday. Steve Quayle, Pastor Langford on Wednesday. We have Daniel Holdings on Thursday and Paul McGuire on Friday. Um, and then might Washington. have a change for Monday. Might might not. Might just be us. Well, yeah. There's there's a few things, Joe, too, about that. But um, keep watch this weekend. We've got some things planned this weekend uh, in response to what's what's happened, folks. So if you're if you're hanging on now uh, to the program, <clears throat> trust me when I say it's it's going to be a very important, pivotal hinge moment in 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 our history. Anyway. Until next week, we'll be back Monday, 8 p.m. Stay safe. God bless. Have a great weekend.